Hey everyone, it's time for our yearly rambling about the power level of investigators in Arkham Horror. As always, we need to get started by explaining what this tier list is for, because no tier list means anything without having established its context first. So first of all, I'm assuming you're playing on standard difficulty. I've explained at length before why I believe standard to be a more enjoyable experience than expert. I'm not going to go into that tangent because I'm already certain this video will be very long without that bet. I'm also assuming you're playing multiplayer, whether that's two-fisted, three-player, four-player, doesn't really matter. But I am not ranking on the assumption of a specific player count other than you're not playing true solo, which A, I think isn't balanced for, and B, I find strictly less interesting than two-fisted. This tier list is also going to assume you have a full collection, and that's partly because this tier list is for how I think these investigators do when you try to optimize them, when you try to make them as strong as possible. I can't honestly give a generic opinion of how good is this investigator with, like, you know, kind of trying to make a good deck. The only thing I can rate with any degree of concrete certainty is how strong do I think this investigator is when you push them as hard as they go. I can't rate what a rogue looks like if you don't even consider big money. Because I'm always considering big money. We'll get into that bias a lot more as the tier list goes on, I'm sure. I have to rate the characters assuming that you're trying to optimize them because there's no way to give a like mean power level of all their gimmick builds and different ways of fighting that aren't just the best ways of fighting. And then I'd have to try to like imagine what that is on every single investigator. It's it's not feasible. The only way I can rank this honestly is ranking them when you're trying as hard as you can to optimize them. And a slight caveat to that, infinite combos are banned. Like I'm not ranking anyone with infinite combos. I can throw all of them into S plus broken, assuming that those infinite combos were available early on in the campaign because they just break the game. However, this is a single player or cooperative game. The only thing an infinite combo does is rob you of the experience of having played the game correctly. It's cool that they exist, they're neat thought experiments, but I'm not assuming anyone builds them, because if I show up to play Arkham Horror and Joe Diamond takes a fucking 15 minute turn and ends the scenario, I'm gonna be mad at Joe. I might be like, oh, that character is so strong. I'm gonna be like, all right, can you just like get a different deck though and we try the scenario again? Why'd you do this? And I hinted at it there when I was talking about infinite combos. I'm not just ranking a deck. I'm ranking how the character does over the course of a campaign. There are going to be a lot of characters where this comes up where by the end of a campaign, they're crazy broken. But at the start, they're not good at all. There are characters that have power spikes at different points in the campaign, and I'm trying my best to sort of average that out into an honest ranking. And lastly, while the tiers do have actual words in them now because formatting works on Tier Maker, I am going to go ahead and explain what the tiers mean. D tier characters are bad. I always flip flop back and forth between no character is D tier, every character can be made to function, and you should not have a D tier, versus, yeah, but some characters do kind of suck though. And right now I'm in the latter, more cynical mood. There are a couple of characters where I think they are truly bad. Next up, we have C tier. These characters are fine. And the quotation marks are not there because they aren't fine. They are fine. But you have to look at fine in a comparative sense. Yeah, they keep pace with the game. They can win campaigns. You are not actively holding your teammates down. However, when fine is the bare minimum and the vast majority of the characters are living above B tier in this tier list, just spoilers, most of the investigators are good with a full card pull when you're trying to optimize. It stops being genuinely fine and starts being like, <sighs> fine, yeah, whatever, sure. Yeah, that's that's acceptable, you can bring that. You're not hurting anyone. Like, it starts being a lot less genuinely fine when you look at it in a comparative sense, and it starts being like, air quotes, fine. B-tier characters are good. I might not personally like B-tier characters as often as not. However, B-tier characters are genuinely good. They are typically going to not just keep pace with the game, but meet the challenges posed to them, survive to win the campaign. And when I say most of the characters live above B tier, that's going to frame just how strong I think most of the investigators are at this point in the card pool. A tier characters are strong, as in they don't have weaknesses. Maybe they're not like insanely powerful, or maybe they are insanely powerful, but they have some Achilles heel that holds them back. Maybe they have a weak point at the start of a campaign. There's a lot of different things that keep you only in A tier and not in these two higher tiers. But A tier characters are genuinely unambiguously strong. A plus characters are where they start getting a little bit ridiculous. These characters are just like as good as A tier characters, but literally unkillable. 
or they have the same weaknesses as A-tier characters, but just vastly outstrip them at the same role. S-tier characters are basically A-plus characters, but across the whole campaign. They show up, they're never in danger of dying, they hard carry their team at whatever it is they're doing, and they do it from scenario one, turn one, to the last turn of scenario eight. They are just as strong as you can reasonably expect a character be from beginning of the campaign all the way to the end of it. There is not really a criticism to be levied against an S-tier character. S plus is a specific couple of characters that I think invalidate scenarios and make the game genuinely not work correctly. I view these characters as actually being broken, and they're sort of soft banned at our table, just no one ever plays them, because when we do, the campaign is less fun. One last thing, this tier list is the one made by playing board games on YouTube. It is a fantastic Arkham channel, easily the most comprehensive and largest library of Arkham content there is on YouTube. If somehow you're watching this and you aren't already subbed to them, go check out their channel. One last thing before I get started ranking these characters, I'm ranking the best version of Investigators as I've already said, but that includes Parallel Investigators. Because technically there are four versions because you're allowed to mix and match. You have Full Vanilla, Full Parallel, as well as Parallel Front Vanilla Back, and Vanilla Front Parallel Back. Because that's too many versions of Skids to rank, I don't have it in me, we're only ranking the best version of Skids, Full Parallel by the way. And we're going to do that with all of the Parallel Investigators, we're going to cover what that is on a case-by-case -case basis. And I bring that up now because I'm about to not mention Skids when I talk about who the worst character in the game is. And by the time we get to B tier and I haven't talked about Skids, you're going to be really suspicious to where I'm ranking Skids, so I need to bring up that we're doing that before we start hitting characters that do have parallels. So who do I think is the worst character in the game now that Skids has been saved from this by the existence of parallels? And honestly, I think it's pretty easy. It's Amina Zidane. Amina Zidane is a genuinely awful character in my opinion. She's in the class that only cares about one stat, but she has all of her stats perfectly averaged out. The Jenny stat line's always terrible, but you slap that on somebody who only cared about one stat, two if you count foot for Mythos Resilience, and it gets tremendously worse than it is on people like Lola and Jenny. Amina Zidane has nowhere near a strong enough card pool or ability to justify that. Yes, she has great economy. No, it doesn't come close to saving her from having the worst Mystic stat line. She is getting some more support in the next expansion with the Mystic Mass that directly synergizes with what she's doing, and maybe that will help salvage her out of last place once we can finally play with Hemlock Vale. Speaking of Hemlock Vale, by the way, some of the cards in Hemlock Vale, my table is already proxying and seeing how they feel, and those will be accounted for. But a lot of it has, like, nowhere near enough support to really talk about, nowhere near anything beyond, like, vague theory. So when it comes to stuff like Sparrow Mask being absolutely insane in Survivor, I'll talk about that. However, when it comes to a Mystic card I saw for the first time yesterday, I'm not about to move Amina Zidane up in the ranks for that. However, she's not alone in D tier. She has another person with a straight three stat line to hang out with, and that's Lola Haynes. I think Lola's genuinely not that bad. I think both of these characters are barely worthy of being in D tier. On a good day, I won't have a D tier, they'll both be in the bottom of fine. However, that doesn't mean they're like actually good by any stretch of the imagination. Yes, you can make functional Kluver out of Lola, maybe there's a fighter build that's functional, but I suspect it's much worse than the Kluver variant. But at the end of the day, whenever I make Lola, I'm not endeavoring to make a really strong character, I'm endeavoring to make her work, just like show up and do my job and get to see if Lola is better than I think she is. Not to like blow the campaign away or surprise anyone with a sick deck, I'm just trying to see, like, do I weigh my team down? That's my goal when I'm optimizing Lola. That's the mind space I'm in. Because the stat line's just so bad, and yes, the taboo makes her tremendously more playable, but honest to God, it doesn't make her that much stronger. It raises her skill floor tremendously. The worst Lolas are so much less bad than they used to, and the best Lolas are better, but not by nearly the same margin. Because you could previously build around your weakness, now your weakness just isn't that big of a deal in the first place. But at the end of the day, you're still a three-fist or three-book character. You're still building a jank-ass giant deck. It's still just not a very strong investigator, and I have nothing good to say about Lola. That's it for the characters that I genuinely think are bad, because even on his worst day, I still think Calvin is fine. I don't think he's good, not even close. And I'm going to explain something when we talk about Calvin that's going to apply a lot as we go through this tier list. And that is that there are two things that make a character strong. Three, really. The first is reliably passing a test. 
That's something that Calvin does. That's what his whole gimmick is, is you get a giant ball of stats and you reliably pass the test. But that's one of the three things you need to be a good Arkham character. It is the most important thing you need, admittedly. It's why these two characters are in D tier, is because they're not even good at passing the test. The second thing you need, and the reason this gap is pretty small, is to survive. Because Calvin is intentionally trying to run his soak down to zero and survive with Jessica Hyde and Pete Sylvester and Talisman Protection, because he's investing assets into play and experience in his deck and card slots into surviving with all of his personal soak used up, he's actually not any better at surviving than anyone else and, in fact, is less good at surviving than basically every other survivor and, in fact, most other characters full on which is not a good place to be. It doesn't matter if you can pass your test if you're more likely to die and not take it in the first place than anyone else. And the third thing that you need to do, once you're actually passing your test and surviving, is you need to compress actions. Whether that's just as simple as playing Leo DeLuca and getting more actions, or you're using deduction to get two clues and one investigate, whatever the method is, you need to compress as many actions into one turn as possible as frequently as possible. That's where the real power is. Passing your test and surviving, that's not actually, like, good. It's mandatory. If you aren't doing that, you're bad. So what you really care about, what really gets a character to be incredible, is broken action compression. Calvin is struggling to pass tests and survive. And don't get me wrong, a well-optimized, well-played Calvin will almost certainly do both of those things. But his action compression is just terrible. Like, you do all this stuff, you optimize this, you set up, and you hit with Meat Cleaver three times, or you investigate for one clue three times. It's not impressive once you've set up Calvin. That's the problem. You're going through all of these hoops, and at the end of the day, you get to be functional. And that's not what you're looking for. However, guaranteed functional is still fine. But I'm going to put some air quotes around that. I'm not going to say it with a grin. Maybe a shit-eating grin, but not an honest grin. Next up on the tier list, we get into the part where, as I rank characters lowly, pretty much anywhere below B tier, if I place a character there, probably someone's mad about it, and even I'm mad about this one. And I want to say, and this is actually generally true for most characters, compared to previous years, if a character seems to have fallen down the tier list, it is usually, not always, but usually, and it's about to be the case that it is, it's the case that that character has stayed exactly the same but my assessment of what the tiers mean has changed, or my assessment of the characters beneath them has risen, and Safina Rousseau, I don't think any worse of than last year, but I've taken like a much more honest look at what she actually does in the games when I see her played, and I'm just frequently unimpressed and frustrated when I see her played, when I think about building her, and I think she's gonna get a lot of help with Hemlock Veil in the mask. I'm not gonna theory craft that because I saw those cards for the first time yesterday. That's when they got revealed, the green and purple mask. And the main problem is something that those kind of address. She is a rogue that wants to use head and foot. Unfortunately, her card pool does not really help her use head and foot very proactively. And when I say that, what I mean is, if you're going to try to do a foot matters archetype, it's actually really hard to get your foot to a usable number where it's consistently reliable in addition to playing a Safina deck. Same thing is true with Head. You can do it, but you find that you're building a very stretched deck that is just functional. You are slightly compressing clues, you are slightly above average safe to the Mythos deck, but you're just going through all of these gimmick hoops and at the end of the day you have an investigator that's like, they're fine. They're genuinely fine. I don't think Safina's bad at all. I think on my worst day I would never consider calling Safina bad. But I am never impressed by her. I never see her just like, really compressing actions, really warping the game. It's just, it's fine. She also has the dubious honor, and <laughs> she's the lowest ranked rogue, so it checks out, of being the only rogue that doesn't want to run big money cards. Because she has to run 18 events, and that limits her to 13 other cards, and that's just really not enough for all the big money setup bullshit, in addition to just having a deck that actually does things. And then additionally, big money gives you two more actions a turn and two more of every stat, but having five actions to investigate or fight at base value four is just absolutely useless. So even if Safina could afford to do the setup, she doesn't really have a benefit for it, unlike most characters in Rogue. And I do genuinely wholeheartedly believe, there are videos I've made on this, that Big Money is the best archetype for Rogue because it does three things. It makes your stats better, it gives you more actions, and it makes you safe to the Mythos phase. Pretty much every Rogue wants at least two of those three things. 
As a result, the fact that Safina really can't use the archetype and then is struggling to get her stats to places that are reliably doing the thing she needs to do, it's just, it's fine. Like, she does it, but it it's not clean, it's not impressive. You're playing Pilfer and up to Jesus, help. Why, why is that the best thing I can do? And like, it's not that bad, right? What you're actually doing is you're playing Pilfer and you're waiting to commit manual decks before you play Pilfer. But even that, right? Like, I could just play Winifred if I want to spam Pilfer. She's not doing anything she does better than anyone else. As I'm editing this, I'm going to cut myself off somewhere when I decide I'm starting to go off the rails. Because the reality is that Safina is fine. But I just genuinely don't think that anything she has access to is good. It's just functional. Like, that would be the honest name for this tier, right? If I renamed this to Functional, that would be incredibly honest. And it honestly sounds worse than fine with air quotes, right? But I'm going to leave it as that because that's how I genuinely feel about the C tier characters. And it's a word that keeps coming up when I'm describing them. Anyways, on to the next functional character. I can never tell you that Marie Lambeau doesn't work. But what I can tell you is that I've never had her in a game and thought, wow, Marie's carrying. Marie's doing so much work. Marie's so much more than a forehead mystic. The fact that she has a little bit of secret access in four book isn't really helpful. The fact that David got untabooed does help her a lot. That taboo really shit on Marie. And she's still this low, even with the taboo removed. Because the reality is that the taboo, whether it's there or not, Marie just sometimes randomly gets an extra action because all the Doom assets kind of suck except for David. So you build a Marie deck with suboptimal Doom assets and you get more actions, or you build, a, you build a Marie deck that just has David and you very rarely trigger your ability but generally have the better deck. You're a forehead mystic with very limited access to cards. In fact, more restricted than usual mystics. You don't get access to all Mystic cards for and up. That's only for spells, which admittedly are the most important ones, but it locks her out of doing cool stuff like true magic builds because that's not a spell and it is for experience. And it's just deeply frustrating trying to figure out how do I use all this book? How do I use my weird card access? How do I X, right? And at the end of the day, like you're kind of just a forehead Mystic and there's a lot of interesting things you can try and then you play the game and like, let's be honest, you're just a forehead mystic who randomly gets extra actions from David sometimes and who has deep knowledge in their deck. That tends to be the full effect of playing Marie Lambeau. She's just genuinely, it doesn't click. I've never seen a deck with her that worked. I have seen people link me decks that are like, you do this really cool thing with, oh God, I don't even remember the name of this signature asset or sorry, this researched asset for Seekers. It's the one where you investigate and you over succeed for more clues. Like, there are builds for her reliant on that. And I just look at those, I'm like, oh man, Scenario 1 though, right? Like, what are you doing in Scenario 1? I, I've seen decks in Marie where, like, the dream is so good. And the reality is you're even worse at level 0, and most of the time that dream isn't happening. I cannot, in all honesty, say I've ever looked at Marie and thought, this is good. I've looked at things from Marie and felt hype more so than most characters, and more so for any character under B tier probably, I look at Marie and I try to make stuff work. But as you can tell by her ranking on the tier list, I never do make it work. And I've never seen somebody else do it in a degree that makes me think, oh, I'm messing up. It just reinforces my pre-existing opinion that she is, honest to God, not that good of an investigator. And that sucks, but it's where I'm at with Marie. Next up in C tier, we have the roguiest rogue, Kaimani Jones. They are probably three-way tied for Rogueus Rogue with Parallel Skids and Finn Edwards. However, if you consider a huge part of the Rogue identity to be spending many actions and doing nothing with them, Kaimani Jones is no contest the Rogueus Rogue. Their ability is just way, way too inefficient for them to actually be good as main fighter, and it does nothing as main cluver. Kaimani Jones is really only playable as a true flex investigator, but even then, you have this awkward thing where, like, you draw a rat and, well, shit, I guess that takes me a minimum of two actions to kill. However, that is sort of a double-edged sword. Because while it's true that Kamani sucks at killing rats, when you start encountering non-elite enemies with, like, five fist and two health, or just chunky normal guys with, like, three fist and three health, I would say that Kaimani's ability on those enemies is as good or better than a good fighter with a good weapon, because those are typically taking two actions to bring down anyway. 
The major issue Kaimani actually faces is that even once you lock yourself in to that true flex role, your card access is kind of just bad. Like, tool access really isn't that good. It doesn't let Kamani do anything truly special. Their stat line is not incredible. It hard locks them into playing Foot Matters. The fact they are a flex character with that specializes in non elite enemies, it means they're either spending experience to help fight the boss by having like a dirty fighting and a knuckle duster in an underworld market so they can help fight elites later on, or they're just a flex that genuinely doesn't help with the boss but does scale up its HP. Either way, that's a problem. You just end up in a situation where you play true flex as Gaimani and you carry your weight, you do things. But very frequently you do them in ways that feels necessarily inefficient because you're relying on your ability. And very frequently you find that Kaimani's card pool and stat line is not helping you to get the job done and is in fact just restricting you into suboptimal ways of doing the job. I'm doing a third take of this. Because while I'm sure that some people disagree with like some of the people I've ranked tremendously, because I think everyone in C tier is to some degree controversial. I think Bob Jenkins is easily the most controversial one, like holy shit. Because I know that community thinks Bob is pretty good. And I look at Bob and I see four book. I see red zero. I see green zero to five. Not really, but close. And I see an ability that says your team gets an action every turn. Because that's what it does, right? It's essentially Carson's ability, but more restrictive, and Carson's ability is the bee's knees. Like, your teammates have items, and your Bob deck has items, so you will be playing an item every turn. It is a very good ability. But the reality that we see at my table is every time Bob gets played, he just does terribly. Because four book is not enough in and of itself to do your job, and trying to find clues with red zero doesn't really care what your book is. Green characters have janky foot matter stuff that Bob isn't very good at. They have big money stuff that, like, yeah, Bob can do it, but he's literally one of the worst characters in the game at it. And, oh man, it's just frustrating because the card pool just doesn't quite jive presently with having Bob actually find clues. Like, his ability is good. As a third wheel Kluver, like you have main Kluver, secondary Kluver Bob, main fighter, he's actually pretty good. Like, if I were ranking him strictly on that, and I'm going to, I'm going to rank him strictly on that and put him at the bottom of my B tier. And now I'm going to elaborate on why I've made this last minute change, because as you can tell by the order I'm placing these, two things. First, I didn't cover this earlier. The further to the left you are, the better you are. That I am taking that into account, although in a lot of cases it's apples to oranges, right? Like, how am I going to look at you with a straight face and tell you that Safina and Marie have a clear, direct one-to-one -one comparison? This is a sort of... We're doing jazz here. We're going by feel. There's no way to apples to apples compare these two characters. But generally, the further left they are, the better I think of them. The second thing, though, is that I do assume your team cares that you're there and they built around you, right? If you show up on Sister Mary, probably someone else is a Bless build. In fact, you probably showed up as Sister Mary because someone talked about running a Bless composition, right? If you play a Flex character, it's a safe assumption that your other two teammates aren't both playing hard clubbers, correct? I assume that your teammates care that you're there and build around you. And because of that, I will rank Bob higher, assuming he's that third wheel Kluver. However, he has never successfully performed at the level that a main Kluver needs to do at any campaign he's been in. Just with four book and the card pool he has, he has not managed to do it. I will say, also, the Hemlock Veil just revealed the matchbox or whatever it is for survivors, which is the most staple item in Bob I've ever seen and it will likely help him a lot. However, I want to be clear, it's only because I assume you have a super competent fighter and double Kluver that Bob gets to get away with getting out of my seat here. This is a last minute change. I have my fully planned out tier list on the other, on the other monitor, and that's just the thing I have. I like thinking about the game. I have a tier list, and I like moving things around in it and talking with my table about whether they think X character or Y character is stronger, and having that weird, interesting conversation about apples to oranges is Safina worse than Marie. It's actually something that me and my table find fun, so I just have a tier list open for this sort of stuff all the time. Anyways, I think Bob, by the skin of his teeth, because he can be that third wheel support Kluver, does get to get out of C tier. But there's one more person that doesn't get to get out of C tier. That's Jenny Barnes. There's only so high that stat line gets to be. And I won't be talking about Wilson Richards today, but I do think he actually will get out of C tier because he actually is 3-4-4-3. Neither here nor there. Let's talk about Jenny. 
Jenny Barnes, you can argue, should be like probably one of these two tiers because she's that strong as of like scenario four or five. She gets so much extra experience in the Green Man Medallion, and I will respond to a specific thing said on one of the tier lists by playing board games, that if you need that much experience, you're just bad at the game, that's a horseshit false dichotomy. Experience is good, it makes your character stronger. I don't need experience to beat scenarios, but it's kind of hard not to when you walk into scenario eight with a 90 experience deck, right? Like. Characters are better with more experience. That's why my table banned Delve Too Deep, as we thought it broke the curve of the game. Jenny Barnes, using Green Man Medallion, generates like an entire extra campaign of experience. If you build a deck design around cycling quickly, being a big money hoarder, and charging the hell out of that thing. There are some campaigns that aren't conducive to this, obviously. But the big thing about it is that Jenny Barnes, in Scenario 1, is a bad character. Just like straight up, she's bad. Scenario 1 Jenny Barnes is a bad character. Green Man Medallion Jenny Barnes in Scenario 1, I will actually go as far as to say is maybe the worst character in Scenario 1. Say what you will about Amina Zidane and Lola Hayes, they aren't spending multiple turns making money to burn for experience next scenario in Scenario 1, which typically is where your investigators are at their weakest, where their game plan is the least solidified, and where you will have the most unexpected hurdles. Jenny Barnes, the thing that makes her insane later in the campaign, makes her even worse in the first scenario. So on the whole, where do I think Jenny Barnes sits when her power fluctuation is all over the place because she's really bad, but she's being carried by high experience? And I think top of C tier. I think with a good player, you'll probably be functional just barely in scenario one. By scenario three, you'll be good, You'll be very strong by the end of the campaign. I don't even know if they'd be genuinely overpowered, but I think at the end of it, I don't feel like I can honestly call Jenny Barnes good. She's functional. She does some genuinely broken things that nothing else does. But she also has one of the worst early campaigns of any character in the game, and I cannot overlook that and say she's any better than C tier. Now, getting back into the regular order of things, above Bob and the good tier, Next up, we have another survivor. It's Rita Young. I genuinely think Rita's good now. Because like I said with Bob, where I think that Bob should be a third wheel kluver and your fighter should be like a real hard carry fighter. We're talking Mark Harrigan, Tony Morgan, Will Yorick, like the top tier of fighters that can really carry their team. In the same respect, I think if a Rita Young is your main fighter, then your other characters should include like a flex character that's really good at fighting, to help take the slack off of Rita, so she has more time to dig for dirty fighting, or more time to knock an ornate bow, for instance. Rita Young, as a main fighter, suffers from needing very specific cards very badly, and she suffers from possibly having some awkward scenarios derived from relying on ornate bows in some builds. And you can be like, no, 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 you need to play Pilfer 3, we've, my table's had this talk. I don't know when at my table, we don't understand. How are you paying for Pilfer? Uh, can you reliably pass that test without like, like I know you can Pilfer at two shroud location, but can you actually do that at four shroud locations where the team needed the help, right? Like our table just doesn't see how Rita is A, reliably Pilfering high trial values, or B, even paying for Pilfer as well as doing any other role in the first place. But we do think that Rita as main fighter is actually a genuinely good main fighter. I, I've gotten over all that. Sweeping kick is nuts in her. Dirty fighting is nuts in her. Sweeping kick, dirty fighting, or Nate Bow in Rita Young is like some of the best burst fighting in the game. And while no, she's not good at, say, killing rats, which is a pretty standard fighter job that sucks to be bad at, she is very good at the things that other fighters struggle with. And on the whole, while I wouldn't say she's one of the better fighters in the game, I would definitely say she's a good fighter. And if there were more powerful economy available to her, she might start being a genuinely strong or even very strong flex character, but it's the red economy really preventing her from going to the moon with Pilfer. Next up, a character that's like not high on the list. This is still bottom 10, right? Yeah, this is the 10th worst character, but it still seems deceptively high for Father Mateo. I don't like Father Mateo. I played him in Dark Matter on the channel with Sister Mary, and that blessed team absolutely ran over that campaign. And it really showed off how good Ancient Covenant is, 
at disguising the fact that he's a forehead mystic, right? Because, like, yeah, being a forehead mystic sucks. But Ancient Covenant says that six times per game, you use Rite of Seeking and it just passes. No risk of ending your turn. No risk of pulling a bad token. You just pass. And it turns out that just the ability to do that in a mystic is really fucking good. And because his stat line's, like, mediocre and bad and evenly spread, it has the side effect that he can probably favor this on Ancient Covenant any scenario test in the game, because most of them are not difficulty 5, most of them are difficulty 4-ish, meaning that he can break open that door or whatever it is that you need to get done. And because of mostly just favor of the sun being really good in Father Mateo, that gets him to be a good character in spite of the fact that he's a forehead mystic. The rest of the deck genuinely does stuff, I forget what it was, I think Jacob Morrison might have been involved, I don't know. Like, the main thing that is good in Father Mateo is just favor of the sun and mystic with Ancient Covenant does so much work. And then beyond that, he's a functional investigator with other cards in his deck, but they really don't matter. It's just that combo. I, I'm not going to talk about him anymore because it's just that. This is how high I rank that combo at Forehead and a Mystic. Better than nine characters, apparently. But I don't think it's better than Joe Diamond's. And I wish Joe Diamond were better than this because, like, every time someone says they're going to play Joe at my table, Okay, every time Andrew says he's going to play you at my table, because it's always Andrew. But we always get hyped. We're like, fuck yeah, Joe. And then he shows up and he plays a different Joe deck. We don't know how he's found the ninth Joe deck, but he's come up with a new Joe build. And it's the same as every other Joe build. It either does a lot of stuff and dies a lot, or it doesn't do that much and it's safe. Like, Joe's good. He's a seeker with four book and access to practice makes perfect and deduction level two. He's not going to be bad. You can't make that bad no matter how hard you try. But the fact he has two in both mythos stats does not do him any favors. It means every time you build a Joe deck, your main concern is staying alive and then finding something unique to you you can do afterwards. But with four and fist, you're trying to, like, find a cool way to fight. And sure, Machete, Survival Knife, and uh, Michael Lay... That's a cool thing unique to him as a Kluver that makes him like a flex goon in a really interesting and powerful way. You can go one further. You can run a Bandolier and a Dream Diary to make you Mythos immune in a big hand deck. That's cool. And ah oh man, the setup's getting pretty high. So like you put in Ever Vigilant so that you actually set up in a timely fashion. And at the end of the day, you have a deck that like does fight effectively and flex really well and find a good number of clues. And you're fully self-sufficient and you're not going to die the Mythos deck, except for like in scenario one and two a little bit. That part sucks. And like, you're a little bit draw dependent, let's be real, but y you do the stuff, you do it. But you never do more than any other seeker what is a clue finder. Runic Axe is a card <laughs> and no one who uses Runic Axe has been raided yet. That's not a coincidence. <laughs> But, like, if you were a flex character holding a runic axe and you use the inscription on the elders, right? You probably kill as many guys and get as many clues as Joe Diamonds. Like, just, just runic axe does it. And you probably have better than 2-2 two -two Mythos Resilient stats. The problem with Joe is that when you solve the puzzle, you spend so much time and experience solving the puzzle that you don't accelerate the rate you're getting clues. Or if you do the clue thing, then you don't solve the puzzle and the Mythos deck just beats the shit out of you. And if you make use of your fist, then that's cool. You spent more time setting up and less time progressing the game, and it's actually two steps forward, two steps back, and you're right where you started. And that's when you optimize it. When you do it the first time, it's one step forward, two steps back, and you actually like, oh shit, the game ended, and I still have a survival knife in my hand. Why'd I even buy this thing with experience? Joe is a really cool puzzle. And every time a card comes out for Joe, every time we look at a new theory craft for Joe, we think we're on the verge of cracking it because Joe promises to go straight to A+, the moment that he sets up fast enough to resist the mythos phase and do the things. But he never, ever does. I love Joe. I love him more than Calvin. But even though Calvin's ranked a lot lower, I find Joe infinitely more frustrating because I know Calvin's not good. But Joe keeps telling me he's not just good, but incredible, and it never happens. And a character that has a lot of similarities with Joe, that I think I might be even underrating a little bit, is Roland Banks. As a fighter, he promises to get more clues, right? You're gonna kill people and get clues. You have this really cool build you can do where you use practice makes perfect with deduction and perception, but you use it on your seeker clover instead of yourself and you just give the skills to them, and that's a really cool thing that you can do that 
like no other fighter gets to do. But then you have five sanity and a random sanity trauma weakness. And also, it if you're not getting the trauma, then it undoes the clues you got to some degree. So you end up playing a guy whose like main selling point sort of self counteracts itself and who's terrified of mental damage. Cause like Mark Harrigan also has this split of health and sanity. And no one, a lot of people do actually. A lot of people say falsely that Mark Harrigan is free. Shit's not true at all. I'll get into that much later. But the thing with Mark Harrigan is if you build a deck designed to heal and soak, because you're Mark Harrigan, you cycle your whole deck instantly because you're healing and soaking and taking the damage and healing and it's great. But if you do that in Rollwind, you just you just like played Tetsuo and like good job, you soak some damage. It didn't draw two cards by doing it. When you try to fix Roland's frailty, like with Joe, all you do is you fix your frailty. It's not like fixing your frailty on a mark here again, where it feeds into itself and becomes a benefit by drawing cards. It just fixes the problem. And that's really holding Roland down. Roland is not getting as many clues as he should because of that weakness. He's not as safe as he should be because, I mean, he's exactly as safe as he should be. That's the problem. He has five head and it feels like he has five head. He's not Tony Morgan coming in with an infinite soak combo and well connected to be sure he's gonna survive. He's just a five head guardian trying to solve the problem and it really holds him back. I genuinely think Roland be at least a tier higher, at least in the bottom of strong, if he had six sanity soak. It's that much of a problem. But he's not the worst guardian by much because this is a character that I really don't like. You probably know this if you watch my fun rankings. I don't like Tommy Muldoon. I think he's a deeply frustrating character whose identity simply doesn't work, and I think the best way to build him is just to ignore everything unique about him and play as a 5 Guardian Survivor 2, and just pretend that Becky and your weakness aren't really important things and try your best to ignore them. And that's really shitty. However, that's a really good card pool. 5 Guardian Survivor 2 is actually just really, really strong cards. And the more you build into trying to get stuff out of your resources or out of your try, let's try that again. The more you build into trying to get resources or bullets out of your dying ally assets, the more you try to build away from that weakness, the more you try to optimize a super Becky deck, the less you're capitalizing on just like the card draw and utility offered by Survivor 2. And I think if you just play to the card pool, Tommy Muldoon's pretty good. I don't think he's strong. I think that he stood to, like, if he got to play the identity he wanted, if he got to recycle allies and it's like guard dog, guard dog, and you're just like taking all the damage and reflecting it and getting bullets, and it's great. But then you draw a rookie mistake, both guard dogs go in the discard pile and the deck concept stops working. Like, if you got to actually play that deck concept, if he had a different weakness, he'd be very strong. But because he doesn't get to play to the identity he wanted due to how crippling his signature weakness is, the card pool's still really good, but he doesn't get to be that high on the tier list. A little bit later in the tier list, around the middle of A or maybe the middle of A+, we're going to start seeing a lot of characters where I'm like, man, should this character be higher? But everyone above them is rock solid, incredibly strong. Winifred is one of the few characters where I'm genuinely wondering if I'm severely underrating her. Because Winifred draws like a lot of cards, just like free deep knowledge every turn, it's nuts. Winifred also has terrible do something stats and has to go through a lot of work to set up to actually do something with the stats. The card pool does help this a lot these days. Foot Matters Winifred is much more real than basically every other Foot Matters character. However, she also has one head and is heavily restrictive in her deck building. And I am typically, I'm feeling like I'm playing a more complicated character with a lot more potential to fail when I'm playing Winifred, which like, yeah, appropriate to the Daredevil, absolutely. But being a daredevil is not like a very optimal way to live your life, right? It's not like it's a really thematic deck that works really well conceptually, and it's a good deck. But at the end of the day, I've got one head, a terrible mythos phase. Every single test I'm doing, I'm like jumping through hoops, trying to figure out what two skills to commit to make it probably pass. It's still not guaranteed even with the two skills. My stats are terrible, except for Pilfer, because you'll have like opportunist manual decks Pilfer every turn once you're going, and that's really nice. That's the one thing Winifred does that's really good if you can get her economy to handle it. And that's the big puzzle with Winifred, right? Because you can just make a shitty big money Winifred and it'll work. But the puzzle with Winifred is how do I make a deck that just barely pays for Pilfer three or four times? Not every turn. There's only so many clues on the map. 
But if you can get a Winifred deck that is going to reliably succeed at Pilfer four times in a game and then like do some other stuff, that's a pretty good deck. It's a puzzle that feels worth solving. But because of her one head, because of how vulnerable she is to the auto fail, like that's the huge thing, right? I've had Winifred games where I'm like, turn four, Pilfer, manual decks, opportunist, with two or three other cards in hand, auto fail. And the deck just stops. Next turn, I just draw three cards. That That's all I've got. I can't do anything else. That huge auto fail vulnerability, because with other characters, like, like that happens on anyone, right? In our most recent campaign, or no, one of our most recent campaigns, I played Joe. I was trying big hand flex Joe. And I had in Depths of Yoth, well, we went down and like, we died on depth four at the start. No, we died on depth three, actually. We didn't even get to depth four. However, we should have gotten to depth four because I auto failed practice makes perfect with deduction twice. Deduction level two at that, which is essentially a 16 clue deficit to auto fails. But you know what I did on my other turns? I continued to play the game normally. I didn't just be like, oh, well now I can't get clues. And that's what happens when Winifred's key turns get destroyed by the auto fail. Other characters, when they get auto failed on their big actions, it sucks, but they get to keep playing the game. And with Winifred, sometimes it's just, it's just a wrench straight into the clockwork of the character and it stops working and you have to reset. And it's a brutal weakness that makes Father Mateo her best friend and that's a really interesting interaction that she's a daredevil and she needs someone to pray to God for her. I fucking love that. But as much as Winnie is a thematic success, as an optimal, powerful character, it's, it's just not there. Man, I don't like putting Sister Mary this high on the tier list. I want to think she's bad. The issue with saying Sister Mary is bad is there's, just, there's simply too many ways to make up for having bad fists as a guardian fighter. I do think Flex Sister Mary is terrible. Like, I've made the deck where you try to investigate using your forehead, and there's some more support coming out for that. There's like the new Bless Investigate event that's coming out. But my experience was that it was the worst deck I had played in a long time when I tried it. And I I think that Fighter Sister Mary is just like unambiguously good. So one thing that's really important with Fighter Sister Mary is that she's effortlessly enabling the Bless archetype. I am not suggesting you play Holy Spear and Sister Mary. Quite the opposite. I think if you were to play Holy Spear and Sister Mary, she's unambiguously worse than Tommy Muldoon. Because now, rather than enabling Bless for someone else, you're just using Holy Spear, and like, it's honestly not even a good Guardian weapon. It's worse than Flamethrower builds, it's worse than Cyclopean Hammer, it's worse than Runic Axe. Don't build Holy Spear decks. Instead, you put those Blesses in, and then someone else like Father Mateo, who's really good at capitalizing on Bless, but really shit at putting it in the bag, they get to use them. And that also feeds into why I think her Three Fist is so fine. With cards like Cyclopean Hammer and Runic Axe, having entered the card pool after her, she can attack just at really good, viable numbers relatively effortlessly later in the campaign. Yeah, early in the campaign, it's rough. Like, no contest, it's rough. Early in the campaign, you need to, like, use In the Thick of It to buy Ace of Swords. I think the new Guardian Mask is absolutely insane and also just does the same shit, kind of, so that can be in the same sort of category. Like, early in the campaign, you need to work around that bad fist really aggressively. But Brand of Cthugga is insane when your base head is higher than your base fist as well. Like, there's just enough cards in the card pool that entered directly after Sister Mary that fighting at three fists with her is kind of not a problem. It's something you can build around and overcome. Just in the most recent expansions, Sister Mary has gotten so much better and is genuinely, unambiguously good. I might be underranking her. She might deserve to be in Trunk. She's that close. And that tells you that I think the remaining characters in good are also all very good. Starting with... Preston Fairmont. I I don't know. I think I'm underranking the shit out of Preston Fairmont. But I also look back on like the deck I used. Because here's the thing, right? Early game big money decks, they're bad. Even in Preston, they're bad. You need like 20 experience of cards before big money does good things. And Preston Fairmont has the unique ability to transition from Dark Horse to big money. And that's not just conceptually really cool. It's not just an interesting and unique thing you can do in deck building, it is powerful. It's a way to bypass the early game weakness of big money decks. But in those, er like in the late scenarios, I thought he was very strong, for sure. But those dark horse scenarios at the start, I consistently had turns where I'd be like, I investigate five to three with Mariner's Compass. And that was it. I had two other actions, they didn't matter. 
I just had the up to Mariner's Compass check, and if that failed, I was a useless on the turn. I would draw an enemy. I was the flex. I'd have a fire axe in my other hand. I'd be like, all right, I can attack it up two twice. And if I draw a bad tokens twice, I've skipped my whole turn because I cannot attack it a third time. With Preston Fairmont, I felt like I was living at the mercy of the bag in those early scenarios when I was playing Dark Horse. And I think genuinely the character I played performed better than that. He was strong, maybe even very strong. But I cannot shake the feeling that the character I played was an above average performance and that Dark Horse Preston is not reliable enough to get into the strong tier. And that even with his insane late game big money hoarder decks, he still gets held down by his early game unreliability as a Dark Horse deck. Next up, we have Monterey Jack. And um, I very recently watched Monterey Jack get played at my table. And I have a hard time articulating why I don't like them. Just as hard of a time as I had trying to build a deck for them, really. Monterey Jack's just a very difficult character that doesn't go smoothly when I think about them. I will say, something really, really good for Monterey Jack is you can use In the Thick of It to buy the recently untabooed Higher Education. And as a one-head character with only four book where you're probably main Kluver or Flex, whose ability draws cards and gains resources, Having access to higher education to beat Shroud values or pass Mythos checks in Scenario 1 is really good. Like, in the thick of it, higher education is doing a lot of work to get Monterey Jack to the top of the good tier. He was originally much lower around Joe, maybe. His deck building's hella awkward, right? He's got access to Well Connected, which at first seems like how you're gonna fix your issues, but then you realize that all the Seeker economy is level zero and that you only have so many level zero cards, so it doesn't really fit. All the good economy stuff like Easy Mark that you would you would think of it as core big money cards, they're not allowed to Monterey Jack. That is that deck is actually just like well connected, doesn't really work in him to fix his mythos. So you end up just running you handle this until the end of the game, or until you feel like you've comfortably got higher education permanently enabled. It's not a bad solution. Higher education is a good solution. But it feels like it locks in your in the thick of it and your game plan so aggressively. Ultimately, the reason I don't think Monterey Jack gets to be listed as strong is just because, like, those early turns suck. You're often in a map where it's like, oh, you can't move, or you don't have the money to spend on higher education. You've just set up in the early turns. You don't have money for higher education, or your hand size is under five. Like, when he's late in the scenario, like, even turn four in the scenario, I see Monterey Jack, he's moving around, he's getting clues, he's doing shit, he's a good character. I keep seeing him draw a Crypt Chill, and then someone else drew Crypt Chill. And then he draws another Crypt Chill, and he passes at 7 to 4. And if he had failed, it'd be like, oh no, my cigarette case. Anyway, I play another one. Like, the Monterey Jack I've seen is a very safe character that is not Mythos Vulnerable. He has a strong ability where he's gaining either a card or a card and a resource every turn. But there are so many powerful level 0 Seeker cards. If he were just Rogue 0 to 2, Seeker 0 to 5, just like immediately A plus, high A plus, not even close. But because he doesn't have those cheap experience Rogue cards, because he doesn't have unlimited level 0 Seeker cards, he has this super awkward deck where you genuinely struggle to get, like it's just not as efficient as it should be. A lot of the investigators from Edge of the Earth had that problem where their deck building is super awkward and it's hard to be efficient with it. But I think in Monterey Jack and Bob, it's easily at its most problematic for those two characters. And Bob, I'm not sure being red 0 to 2, green 0 to 5 would really have fixed him. But in Monterey Jack, if he had Trish's card pool, he'd go straight to the moon. It's just the awkwardness of the deck building in those early scenarios that really holds him down. And even in late scenarios, right? Like, he'd be better if he had easy marks, and he doesn't, so he's not. He's a good character, though. Unambiguously quite good. And lastly, at the top of my B tier, we have, sadly, another Guardian. It's Leo Anderson. There's just a lot of Guardians where, like, the worst a Guardian can do is good. You're a main fighter, like, half your card pool is dedicated to different exceptional ways of fighting. You've got the Guard Dog Beat Cop Machete Enchanted Blade School, where you're relying on pseudo-weapon assets to have more reliable draw if you've got good numbers. You can go for flamethrower extra ammo if you just need to waste crowds of dudes, like if it's a swarming campaign, or just a high enemy campaign. If you're running flamethrower or any other weapon, Brandon Thug is a great backup weapon, but in particular with flamethrower because you can't hold anything else. 
You've got the Cyclopean Hammer or Runic Axis schools, although these days Cyclopean Hammer is almost strictly worse than Runic Axe. I should just make a video about that card being completely fucking busted, I guess, but point being, Guardians have too many great ways of fighting for a Guardian that doesn't have a crippling problem to be anything less than good. Leo Anderson has a lot going for him. He also has one in his foot, and let's be real, having a two in your foot is just as bad as having a one in your foot. They're all failing their grasping hands. They're all failing ants. They're all bad. However, he does have a crippling weakness to a certain type of treachery, and that's not good. Hilariously, the two things that are actually expeditions that Leo Anderson, the expedition leader, should be on, Edge of the Earth and Forgotten Age, are probably the most punishing campaigns in the game for having one foot, but that's not really important. The thing that makes Leo promise to be better than everyone else, well, I mean, it's, it's straightforward, right? He has Leo Anderson and Haste and Switchblade. So he's going to do a lot of stabbing. He's going to do a pretty good impersonation of Tony Morgan. But the thing he gets that Tony Morgan doesn't is Hallowed Mirror, specifically Hallowed Mirror 3. He can be a really good healer for your team because he will be able to stab everyone to death and then start healing your team. There's a bunch of other cool shit you can do with Leo Anderson. I personally find the team utility of being one of the better healers in the game probably to be the best thing I can do with Leo. But at the end of the day, Leo's just got more reliable extra actions than these other characters. He's got four fists like these two. He's not enabling Bless like Sister Mary, but unlike these two where like, I, I've got a blank character card or a crippling fear of horror damage, Leo Anderson, like he wants to play more allies. He's super safe. He's not gonna die to the Mythos deck. He's as good of a fighter as these guys without their weaknesses. And I think that unironically, if these characters didn't have their weaknesses, I would still rank them above Sister Mary, just like I'm ranking Leo Anderson here. But I do gotta emphasize, I almost put him in strong. I really do value the extra action healing build on Leo Anderson. And coming into strong, we have our first parallel investigator. And an investigator that I am ranking speculatively based on what I've theory crafted for them, but I haven't gotten into play yet. It's Gem Baby. Thanks to his entirely new investigator card, we have a character that might actually not be dog shit in Jim. Because old Jim was bad. Old Jim was arguably the same character as Marie Lambeau. Allow me to elaborate. I think that Marie and Jim like went back and forth in my mind as who was the worst forehead mystic. And it's entirely because Jim Culver had a really cool true magic build where because of research librarian and deep knowledge, he could reliably find true knowledge in a way that, or sorry, true magic in a way that no one except Luke Robinson could. And Marie has access to the ways of finding it, but she couldn't run true magic. And I think that unironically, the original gem was arguably better than Marie because of that build. However, Parallel Gem's just a different character, a hard curse character. And his, all right, he's two separate characters stapled together, right? He has the curse thing, where when you're using cursed synergies, you're getting more charges on your assets. And he has access to all of the cursed cards. And then he also just stapled onto that has the beyond deck, which is like a bunch of random throughput value, but you have to solve a really problematic weakness. Like I think Jim's weakness is much harder to deal with than the similar weakness for Patrice, because he just doesn't have clean ways of fighting or dodging at high enough values to deal with the damn thing. So the way I think Parallel Gem is best, the deck I'm looking forward to playing next time I play a Kluver for my team, is by playing main Kluver Parallel Gem. I'm not going to deal with my weakness. The turn I draw it, last action, I'm going to fail to dodge it and summon it onto the board. And I'll be like, hey fighter, I've got a problem for you. And that's my plan for dealing with it. It's a problem for the fighter and it's a one action tax for Gem, and I can't find a better way to deal with it than that. However, I think the tremendous number of extra charges that Curse Gem gets, combined with the card access that he gets, is actually going to be a really strong character. It looks to me like the Parallel Gem Curse build. I have it at the bottom of Strong, and I want to be clear, this is my low-end estimate. I'm pretty aggressively on the hype train for Parallel Gem, I think he's probably better than this. But for now, he's going to live at the bottom of A tier, right beneath Carolyn Fern. Much like Tommy Muldoon, Carolyn Fern doesn't actually have much of an investigator card. The thing where you're healing horror to gain or give resources, that's not actually super important. Your teammates shouldn't be dying from horror, nor they should be relying on you to pay for their assets. Like, realistically, your team will bend around you being Carolyn a bit, they'll make overly expensive decks, they'll make characters that are more vulnerable to horror damage than usual, 
But this is not a type of support that you actually need when you play Carolyn. The thing that makes Carolyn strong is that she is a four book guardian with access to 15 Splash and Mystic and Seeker, in addition to a bunch of weird access because of her healing cards. She has a couple of broken cool things she can do with healing, like healing field agents. Her entire strength is that card pool, and it is a strong card pool attached to a perfectly functional staff mine. But at the end of the day, the fact that her investigator ability just really genuinely is not very useful is what's keeping her near the bottom of strong. She's definitely a, like more than good investigator. She is on the strong side. I cannot imagine playing alongside Carolyn and thinking she's weak. But she's not like she's not very strong. She's not insane at all. And a huge part of that comes down to having a virtually blank character card, because typically a huge part of a character's action compression is your character card recursively every turn doing something strong, like giving you free charges on mystic assets, giving you five resources every turn, drawing two to three cards in a round. So it speaks volumes to her card pool that I rank her this highly when I think so lowly of her ability. And next up, we have Silas Marsh. If I were ranking pure fighter Silas, I would have him under Leo Anderson. I just want to say that now. I don't think that Silas as main fighter is actually super impressive. I think that you can make a Chainsaw Silas build and it will be marginally more effective than a Pete Cleaver Silas build. The Silas I have seen and been most impressed by was the Dark Horse Flex Silas where you're using Mariner's Compass and a bunch of recursive skills to try to help with the clue output of your team while also being almost as good of a fighter as main fighter Silas. I think he's one of the no, not even one of them. I think he is the best flex Dark Horse character in the game, and I think that Mariner's Compass is one of the most powerful cards in the game, but its requirement of a hand asset and no resources, and a class that is not great at doing book checks, is typically what keeps Mariner's Compass from being really cracked on most investigators. And while it's not insane on Silas, he typically will be going for lower shroud locations, He's still clearing them out pretty damn fast in the Mariner's Compass and really helping out your team's clue tempo while being a perfectly passable fighter. Obviously, he's drawing an unreasonable number of cards of Unrelenting, that sort of goes without saying. He's doing a bunch of side of stuff that's fairly impressive, but at the end of the day, he is still a character that's fairly weak to horror damage, doesn't have great methods of dealing damage, because survivors just don't. Chainsaw, no matter how hard I look at it, no matter how many chainsaw characters I play, it's just fine. Even in Yorick, Chainsaw is not incredible. We'll talk about Yorick later because I think he is the best survivor fighter. But inside his marsh, it's just having someone that's genuinely unambiguously good with a Mariner's Compass while being a perfectly acceptable flex fighter. That's what's getting him this high. His ability's nuts. It's really, really good. It's a big part of why he's still functional as a fighter. And it is also just busted with unrelenting. Unrelenting is also just a busted card. It's a skill that draws two for relatively low cost, but size being able to use it every turn of the game certainly helps. And next up in the strong tier, we have Nathaniel Chip. And we're gonna finally get to talk about another game theory thing because Nathaniel Cho represents something. You cannot kill enemies better than Nathaniel Cho. Earlier I was talking about Bob being the third wheel kluber. You need a fighter that can fight good enough to cover over three people. Nat Cho can do that. Nat Cho can single-handedly kill three players worth of enemies with no difficulty. However, he's only an A tier. That's that's nuts. He's able to, like, that's overpowered, right? Why, why is he not higher? And I'm not about to tell you that he's not higher because you win the game by getting clues. When I first started Arkham Horror, I actually was somewhat of the opinion that if you don't get clues, you can't be overpowered because you can only win the game by getting clues. And I don't think that's true anymore. However, I do think you can't be overpowered without meaningfully accelerating the pace of your game for your team or making your team safer so that going at a slower pace still represents less danger. If the game ends faster, there are less Mythos cards. If you help your team survive the Mythos phase, having more Mythos cards doesn't matter. That's how a fighter gets into overpowered. The thing keeping Cho all the way down here in strong though, is that while he can kill an unlimited number of enemies, the same is not true for tanking an unlimited number of Mythos cards. Now, he doesn't have bad Mythos stats, and you can find Soak inside of the Guardian class. But he is not Mythos immune. He's not doing anything beyond being really good at killing. And his method of killing, while I've never seen him run out of steam and genuinely don't think he ever will, 
is one of the few methods of killing that feels up to the cards, where how good you are at fighting depends on what you draw and when you draw it, where you feel more vulnerable to running out of steam than other characters. I don't think that really happens, it's just a feeling I have about the character. The main thing is that he has no team utility. He's not super mythos resilient. He's an incredible fighter, but he's not helping his team. He's not safe to the mythos phase. And those are really important things to me. That gives you an idea of how strong I think these other characters are, how high I really think of Sister Mary and Winifred when being incredible at fighting only gets you this high. Because if you're not safe to the mythos and you're not helping other people with their roles, you're helping them against the mythos phase, you're just really good at fighting, I think you're just strong. Don't get me wrong, if I thought someone was equivalent to Nathaniel Cho as a cluver, they'd be an entire tier ahead. Cluing is more important than hitting. However, this is a true statement for both roles, and it's more important for fighters who cannot, by doing their role, progress the game. Next up, let's talk about a very different character, Patrice. Patrice is... I don't... <laughs> She's so weird. I said that it's apples to oranges. How can you compare Dark Horse Flex Silas to Fighter Nathaniel Cho? It's apples to oranges, right? If that's apples to oranges, Patrice is a fairy ring in the woods. I Like, it's not even in the same group. It's not a fruit. It's something completely different. Patrice doesn't play the same game as anyone else. Her gimmick isn't just a minor deviation from normal gameplay. She's the only character in the game that has access to Word of Protection 2 that might not buy it immediately. Because even though it's still good in Patrice, the fact you can't hold it for key cards really warps how valuable the card can be. However, at the end of the day, while Patrice is completely different from everyone else in the game, she is reliably passing tests due to cornered and the variety of skills that she's running. She's reliably compressing actions, and that's mostly on the clue front. Her fighting is not super impressive, but she does have the ability to very reliably get two clues when she is investigating. She is genuinely very safe. I struggle to see a way where Patrice is in much danger. I struggle to see a way where Patrice is not flexing really aggressively on the clue front and doing just fine on the fight front. Every time I've seen Patrice, I've thought, damn, I wish I knew what you were going to do next turn, but it's probably good. I want to talk more about Patrice, but I think the more I try to talk about Patrice, the more I need to delve into the nitty gritty of her deck, and we don't have time for that. There are 60 characters. I'm not making a video with 60 deck text to really justify my opinions on these guys. No one has time for that. The video would be like 12 hours long. So that's enough for Patrice. Let's get into the next one, which is Dexter Drake. I think no one's surprised to hear me say that Dexter Drake is strong. We're in the realm of five head mystics now. You might be surprised to hear me say that I think Dexter Drake is the weakest five head mystic, which I actually is. That's true. I stand by that. And we'll cover the others in more details later. But for now, let's just talk about why I think Dexter Drake is stronger than everyone I've ranked so far. I'm going to be honest, I'm digging deep here and I struggle to explain it more eloquently or more elaborately than the words five head mystic. That's pretty much it. There's other stuff. Most of it's just core stuff that's obvious, like Mystics don't have a great economy, and Green gives him 2x Falsian Bargain, 3x Easy Mark, and by the way, Mystics didn't have great draw either. Molly Maxwell is an incredible signature where you can yell Tome to get Scroll of Secrets to draw cards generally. You can yell Relic to get Cyclopean Hammer. You can yell Criminal and get Leo DeLuca, right? There's so many cool things that Dexter has access to from his card pool and from Molly. I think Dexter is unambiguously not just a five-head mystic and good for that, but I think that I'd probably rank a five-head mystic with nothing else. Probably, maybe even below Jim, but they'd still be strong, but I think Dexter's card pool does a lot of work for him. The reason I'm not ranking him higher is because I think his ability is kind of trash. And that's heresy, it's fast action play an asset, how can you say that? But you have to get rid of one. And every time I see a Dexter deck running Switchblade, I internally cringe. Because the more bad cards you put in your deck to enable your ability, the less value your ability gets. Your ability is at its absolute best when you replace Rite of Seeking 5 with zero charges with Rite of Seeking 5 with full charges. It's never going to be better than that. The more interesting your deck is, the more you capitalize on being Dexter Drake, the less good his ability gets. And in terms of where I think the perfect balance is, um, I think it's completely ignoring the ability and just using it to refill your arcane assets, I'm sorry. I just do not, every time I try to evaluate what cards make it into the deck, I'm looking at clever stuff involving Liquid Courage or Switchblade, and I've got like 38 cards in the deck and they're definitely the ones I'm cutting. 
So while Dexter Drake has a great card pool and an ability that is definitely going to give him a couple of reactions in a game, most of his strength is just coming off the back of being a 5-head mystic. In the past, I would not have ranked Diana above Dexter Drake, I think. There might be an old tier list out there proving me wrong, but I feel like in the past I felt very low of Diana. And I can summarize that with the following statement. Agnes has six head with Pete Sylvester and Infinite Horror Soak, so why the hell am I playing Diana Stanley to eventually get six head? So, allow me to defend Diana Stanley from my past criticisms. She doesn't really get to recur her cancels, because she's going to vomit them out as fast as she can to build up her head and become a functional character. However, she will still effectively get to play them like 1.2 times. You're going to waste your first wins, but you will eventually recur them and get their full value. It's just the first time you play them kind of sucks. Her ability does generate economy and card draw and accelerate you through the deck, and I think it is a very good ability. She does scale up to be a 5-head Mystic, and that is worse than just being a 5-head Mystic. I don't think being a 6-head Mystic has any real value, and if I did, Agnes is better at it, that is true. But being a 5-head Mystic, even with some setup time, is a good place to live. Recurring your events once isn't great when you waste them the first time, but it still means you're getting all these cancel events, and a little bit more from the first time when you play them wastefully. Realistically, the reason she is where she is, is because while Dexter Drake I think has the better card pool, Diana's digging through her deck much more quickly than Dexter is, because of her ability. Diana also has, she isn't usually doing it, but she has the option if she draws a bunch of cancels, to instead use the shittier cancels to scale up, and then actually have those games where she's recurring Ward 2, where she's recurring Deny 5, and getting insane value. Diana has the ability to tremendously outperform Dexter, and as a baseline, I think is only a little bit worse than Dexter. And on the whole, I think it averages out to be a stronger character than Dexter. Although the two are, in my mind, very, very close in power level. And now for a harsh change of pace, and for something that I view as a turning point in the tier list. It is Carson Sinclair. I could put Carson Sinclair in Not Applicable, I could put him in the bottom of D tier, and I could put him in the top of Broken. I could put him anywhere in the tier list, and the argument is as follows. Carson Sinclair is exactly as good as his teammates allow him to be because he is a force multiplier for the team, nothing more, nothing less. He's a little bit more than that, he tends to play a deck primarily of soak assets, because he sucks at the mythos phase so he has to protect himself, may as well protect his teammates too. And that's cool, and that means he has some more value for, say, rogues who suck at horror tests, right? However, typically he's just a force multiplier for your team. It's a little bit better than that, because he has an insane amount of front-loaded tempo with Ever Vigilant 4 under a stick to the plan, followed by second turn first watch to guarantee your teammates pop the fuck off. But on the whole, he's just a force multiplier. However, I think he is a force multiplier that is greater than the majority of characters beneath him. I think if you're playing most teams, Carson's going to give you more value than a Dark Horse Silas. Like, sure, you put him next to Amina and Lola, and they'll be like, okay, cool, I investigate at four against difficulty three. And you're like, oh, Christ, why'd I give you an action? But in the majority of circumstances, I think Carson is better than the people currently beneath him. He's also relatively close to the dead middle of the tier list here. But the big thing, the reason I place Carson specifically here is to mark a turning point in the tier list. Below here, there are a lot of characters where I want to move them up and I can like make arguments back and forth. When I try to move someone above this point on the tier list that Carson marks, the people we're talking about are just very, very strong. This is the beginning of the brick wall equality. We're not quite to A plus yet, but the characters at the top of A make a solid case that maybe they should be an A plus. So let's start with somebody that I, at one point in time, had almost in my S tier. Charlie Kane. If you saw my Scarlet Keys campaign, you know about the dog deck. You know how incredibly strong the dog is. <laughs> You've got an assistant. It's a signature card. You know what it really is? It's a dog in a disguise. Because there's nothing better than free action investigate at base 5 on a character with base 1s. It's really good. That deck is nuts. He is an incredibly fast Kluver and a surprisingly good flex because the dogs also bite if you need them to do that. However, scenarios 1 and 2, That's that shit's not online. It's not fully online in scenario 3 either, but it's the shells there. It's functional. 
In scenarios one and two, Charlie Kane is a janky gimmick investigator. It's investigating and they're getting it done, but it's not very good. I think he's better than anyone in C tier, even in those early scenarios as a Kluver. But like scenario five, he's straight up overpowered. It's nuts. Late game Charlie is very broken. It's just those early scenarios holding him down. He's such a fast and powerful clue finder, but you gotta get over that opening hump. And it's not that hard to do that. It really isn't. But it is a problem. And typically, A-plus characters don't have problems like that. For someone who has no problems, but it's just boring, let's talk about Lily Chen. Once upon a time, I think my first tier list I said this, I had her almost in my S tier. And I said if she got another good melee weapon, I'd put her in S. And then they unnerfed Machete, and she fell an entire tier. That's just how it is sometimes. <laughs> so what's changed in my evaluation? Well, all she does is kill people. Remember what I said about Nathaniel Cho? Unlike Nathaniel Cho, I think she's virtually mythos immune because she's going to have four in both mythos stats as well as an ability that passively heals her. Well, not passively, it's an, actual, it's an activated ability, but she has access to it all the time. She doesn't need to draw it and play it. That's what I mean. The main thing getting her this far above Nat Cho, however, is not that she is more resilient to the Mythos phase. That only gets her part of the way up here, maybe around Carson or Diana. She is the strongest scenario one fighter. Yes, I do mean that, because she can swing Dragon Pole at base eight. What's that? You missed Dragon Pole? Okay, Machete at six it is. We'll have to make do. It's not like you're downgrading to something terrible, right? There is nothing even close to Dragon Pole at base 8 with a guard dog in play when we're talking about level 0 characters. There are some characters that compete with this. Obviously, Tony Morgan and Nacho, I think they both lose, but Daniela Reyes is unambiguously better than her in Scenario 1. You'll notice we haven't ranked Daniela Reyes yet. I think Lily Chen is very, very good in Scenario 1, which is typically where your fighters and your team as a whole will find the biggest struggles. I believe I've said that already once this video, so let's not go into it in any further detail than that. Her strength in Scenario 1 is massive, her Mythos resilience is very solid, she is an incredibly good fighter, she is also boring as dirt and I don't want to talk about her anymore, so let's move on. Next up, at the top of our A tier, no, not quite. I go back and forth on the cutoff between A and A+, but very near the top, we have Akachi O'Neilly. Oh, that was an interesting pronunciation. Let's stick with Akachi. Oh, I felt my mouth pronounce that wrong. Oh, that was, that was not good. So, talking about Akachi, I, at some point, made a previous version of this tier list, and I recorded it, didn't get to editing it, and by the time I was going to edit it, I was like, no, my opinions have changed a lot. And I had Akachi, like, slightly above Dexter. And one of my friends is like, how on earth is Akachi better than Dexter? We've recently played Akachi. I feel no hesitation in saying she's better than Dexter, and neither does the person who played her and Dexter most recently. So here's what Akachi does that's nuts. Akachi uses Dragon Pole, and she gets three arcane assets in play, and that attacks at six. Not actually that impressive, but pretty solid for a flex fighter, to be honest. What this really does is it allows her to play Arcane Transmutation. So now she has the best economy of any mystic in the game. That helps her deal with her weakness, lets her transfer charges to Torrent of Power to have more copies of Promise of Power effectively. And the big thing here is that typically as a flex character, you really struggle because if you're just using spells in a mystic, you've got one fight spell, one clue spell, you're super restricted. Having Dragon Pole in your hands and an extra arcane slot makes her tremendously more flexible. If you haven't played a Dragon Pole flex Akachi, it looks a little bit silly on paper, but I cannot overstate just how smooth the deck plays. The mobility is not great. It's a mystic. It has the mystic problems. The draw isn't great. See the previous statement. But in terms of just like walking around reliably doing the thing you're supposed to do, she is investigating at eight with right of seeking, killing rats with relative ease. If she encounters big enemies, she has brand of Cthulhu, And if they have low fists, she can just chip away at them with a dragon pole. It's fine. And then she has access to Torrent of Power in a way that no other Mystic does, as well as Unparalleled Economy. Not that she really needs it, but it's nice to have in a world where most Mystics have to settle for Uncage the Soul and hope they draw their cards together. The Dragon Pole Flex Akachi build is just really, really solid. And it's where I think of all the Flex Mystic builds, other than one specific character, of all the Flex Mystic builds, I think Dragon Pole Akachi is the one that plays the smoothest and does the best job of saying, I'm just going to investigate and do tremendous work with Rite of Seeking, 
and then effectively fill the rest of my actions no matter what the turn sets. Because realistically, just like with Mariner's Compass, Dark Horse, Silas, right? The appeal of Dark Horse is you use Mariner's Compass and you get two clues in one action. The other two thirds of your turn, those aren't nearly as impressive. When it comes to Mystics, you have that one action where you're finding three clues, and then on a lot of locations you have to move. Flex Akachi is the smoothest operation of a Flex Mystic other than Luke Robinson, in terms of just immediately getting a value with that Rite of Seeking and making sure your other two actions are going to be good no matter what happens without needing anyone to babysit you. She's very self-sufficient and very powerful and incredibly smooth and intuitive to play. Which brings us to our last slot in the A tier, a character that I strongly considered putting an A+, it's Mandy Thompson. I do not believe anyone who tells me Mandy Thompson is still S tier, and I will believe them if they tell me she's still A+. That I have no issues with that. I personally am on the other side of the fence. I think she's just high, high A tier. She's definitely strong. She's right on the threshold for me of very strong. Because she has five book, three, three mythos stats. And sure, she has a 56 card deck, which isn't great for consistency, even if you do double scry. But that said, it's pretty good. It's still 56 cards and Seeker. That's not entirely accurate. It is 40 Seeker cards, 10 Splash cards, and five story assets of your signatures, your weakness, your basic weakness, blah, blah, blah. Point being, uh, it turns out that your 10 Splash are really good in Survivor, like insanely good. There are a lot of new cards like out of Crossroads that make 10 Splash and Survivor 1 really strong. The best 40 cards in Seeker are probably better than the best 30 cards in any other color. So is Mandy Thompson the unparalleled reliability and efficiency and raw draw she once was? No, even if you get Mr. Rook, it's an action to use him now, it's brutal. Mandy has taken huge hits to draw speed and reliability, and there is nothing you can do to change that. However, she has still got really good stats and a really strong card pool. And yeah, her ability is kind of like not actually that good with the current card pool, unfortunately, and they probably won't print very many new instant scry effects due to Mandy existing. But like, still very, very strong. There's nothing I can say to make Mandy not a great character. But I do think that that slightly unreliable 55 card deck does keep her out of very strong. She's just not consistent enough. And even though all the cards in her deck are really good cards, and they are, the card pool's just that good, I don't think it's as good. Like, you aren't playing a 32 card deck with Practice Makes Perfect and Deduction 2 anymore. You just aren't. So, like, she's good. I can't say she's not very, very good, but I don't think she hits that threshold for A-plus in my mind. Someone I do think hits the threshold, in fact, I'm using them as my gatekeeper into A+, it is Agnes Baker. Agnes Baker, I mentioned this with Diana, I don't really value that she has six head, but having infinite horror soak on a mystic is pretty good, especially when your signature wants you to be taking damage to your horror directly, because it doesn't work going on Pete, unfortunately, but having infinite horror soak outside of yourself for better triggering of that ability is still really nice to make you safer in general. Also, the red card pool is nuts. At a crossroads, lucky, live and learn, all of these effects are very, very powerful, especially in a mystic. What's that? You auto failed on your clairvoyance? Go again. That's an incredibly strong effect. I don't think it even makes the cut in Agnes. I think making an Agnes deck that actually fits into a 30 card deck is a really hard challenge with the full card pool. And it's only getting worse because like obviously she wants Sparrow Mask, right? With Pete Sylvester and Sparrow Mask in play, her mythos stats are 7-6. It's insane. She has infinite horror soak, but it's not like she's gonna fail the test anyway. She has promise of power if she's actually worried. The card pool and stat line available to Agnes is nuts. The biggest weakness of Agnes is that her signature weakness is ancient evils and that her ability is only useful as a jank-ass beat cop if you're a fighter. And the only way you're doing that is by running painkillers. You don't have great ways of intentionally dealing horror directly to Agnes, and if you're not a fighter, Agnes, then your ability isn't even good in the first place. Then, on top of that, while the game is balanced such that if you draw Ancient Evils, the scenario expected you to lose X Doom based on, you know, the agenda clock and the number of Ancient Evils in the deck, it did not expect you to get Ancient Evils from Agnes Maker, so it's very impactful in terms of the Doom Clock from her. Now, all of that said, her card pool is nuts, her stat line is nuts, and 
like some people, like Tommy, I don't think her ability does her much good. I don't think her signature does her much good, and I think her weakness does her a good bit of harm. Not nearly as much as Tommy, but still a pretty harsh weakness. All of that said, the strength of this stat line and card pool is absolutely insane. She is all the way up and very strong just because of that. It's an incredible card pool and a very good ability. And now it's time to get burned at the stake because we're moving on to the next character. I'm ranking Ursula above Mandy. Fight me, you can't change it. Nothing can change it. I will not stop believing it. So first of all, let's talk about Ursula's card pool. It's basically mono yellow. That's fine. I don't care at all. Seeker has the best card pool. The fact she has a weird restricted card pool doesn't change anything. She has one of the better card pools in the game because she has access to Seeker cards. It's simple as. Now, you can say whatever you want about Karen's Obel and Table Manners, but I'm looking at a Seeker that gets Karen's Obel. And as last I checked, experience is worth more in Seekers because your cards are better. So you better believe I'm taking Karen's Obel and Ursula. And I really don't get the shit that Ursula's given because her ability is essentially a variant of Rex's ability. You should be expecting to move pretty much every turn, which means you get a free investigate every turn. That's one clue if you can pass the test, which as a seeker you can, and Rex's ability gets you a clue a turn. Ursula's ability gets you a clue a turn. And obviously if you believe Rex can reliably pass by two once, you believe Ursula can reliably pass, right? So I don't understand the argument against Ursula being bad because, like, sure, her card pool is worse than Dumbwitch Slash. I'm not pretending it isn't. But she has a variant of Rex's ability. And in terms of triggering it, you can't even be like, oh, it's map restrictive. Because, like, yeah, there are some maps. Like, specifically, Explore and Regatta Age can be pretty rude to her if your fighters are, like, not able to explore for you. But even in really jank situations where there's, like, one location left, you're playing Ursula and Seeker has the best movement in the game. You'll be running cards like Eon Chart or Pathfinder anyway. It is so normal for Ursula's at my table to Pathfinder out of the only location with clues and then Eon Chart 4 back in and investigate twice and without spending an action they have investigated twice. Because they get one from Eon Chart, one from Ursula, right? I don't... I don't understand when people act like Ursula's ability is not top tier. Because it very clearly is. She has good Mythos stats at 3 and 4. She's a Seeker, so she has access to incredible cards. She has a great ability. She's not the most broken Seeker. We've only ranked a couple of them. I'm not even claiming she's in the top half of Seekers, which is funny considering how high on the tier list we are. But Jesus Christ, Ursula is so strong, and I wouldn't cover her in any great detail. I'd have been like, oh yeah, she's a Seeker, but she gets more Investigates. Boring as sin. Let's move on. Just like Lily Chen, but there's this overwhelming sentiment that I see expressed not just on playing board games and people are talking shit, but like on the overall community, on like card discussion pages, on Reddit, where people don't seem to think Ursula is very good, and I genuinely don't understand where it comes from. But then again, I have Bob at the bottom of my B tier in position, what, like eight? So <laughs> we might not see eye to eye with the community on some things here on this channel. So on the subject of me not really being eye to eye with the community on some characters, I think the community generally thinks Finn Edwards is very strong. I, I don't think that's the part we don't see eye to eye on, but I'm not ranking Kluver Finn. I'm also not ranking Flex Finn. I think Fighter Finn is by far his best build. And that might be a bit weird. Obviously it's because of Scarlet Keys, because of Underworld Market and Dirty Fighting. Those are very core cards. But I am not using hyperbole when I say that I believe Fighter Finn has the best crisis management of any fighter in the game. I know Tony stabs a lot, Morgan can stab quite a lot. I know that Guardians have access to flamethrowers. I know that Daniela and Yorick have guard dogs, and a lot of them. But let me paint you a picture for Fen Edwards. You're a rogue. You have a lot of actions, because you have roguey ways of finding more actions. It's the end of the scenario. You've played all your cards, and the bosses are spawning. Let's take a particular scenario with a card called Mindless Dancer. You know the one if you know the scenario, and if not, don't worry about it. Just know it's a big damn enemy where typically in the scenario with Mindless Dancers, the plan for any subpar fighter is let's just not fight it. Let's run, <laughs> cause there's three of them and it's easy to run. Finn can kill all three at once. 
maybe not kill them, but he can neutralize all of them and kill at least two of them. I'm gonna open up a card. I don't normally do that during this video, but I'm gonna open up a specific card. The 25 automatic is a very iconic card for rogue fighters, especially now that dirty fighting exists. The trip dirty fight 25 automatic double attack to essentially get three actions for the price of one, it's, it's really nice. Did you know that if you look at the wording on the reaction for after you evade an enemy at your location, perform the above fight ability without spending an action? This does not say a damn thing about targeting the enemy you just tripped. Those words are just not there. Now, the reason this would matter is let's say you're fighting three enemies at once because you just walked into a location with three mindless dancers. And let's say you're fully set up because you've drawn three minus answers to play in the scenario. You could have ran earlier. This is easy to do, and we did it during our scenario. Ben has a 25 automatic in his first hand, and another one in his second hand. And he's got a hidden pocket on his trench coat that Lonnie's been fixing up to give him infinite soak. And in that hidden pocket, he's got a switchblade. And of course, he's a dirty fighting master. That's been in play since, like, turn two. Obviously, this is, like, very late game. But if we're talking crisis management, the boss is here, so... Late game it is. You can, as Fen, free action evade, 25 automatic, 25 automatic, stab. And the stab was free because of dirty fighting. And then you evade the next guy and you 25 automatic him, 25 automatic him. And then second action, you evade the third guy. And you 25 automatic the second guy to finish him off. What's that? You got an auto fail somewhere? You 25 automatic that guy too. And then you have one action left and there's a single tripped mindless dancer alive and you probably stab him, right? Or if you got unlucky, you stab somebody else. But the point is that because this text doesn't specify that you actually have to target the guy you tripped, which is just like something that was in my head because it's intuitively how you use the card, it's actually even thematically cooler, right? The idea that you trip somebody and then whip out the tiny gun and shoot someone else because they weren't paying attention to you while you were tripping someone else, like it still fits the thematic identity, but that gives a set up fighter Finn unparalleled crisis management because he can just empty 225 automatics in one turn when the crowd finally gets here. Now that alone is not why he's here. His unparalleled crisis management only serves to counteract the fact that in scenario one, he's kind of not great. <laughs> like, let's be honest, when you have a just hard reliance on dirty fighting and you have one copy and it's not an underworld market, because you bought it within the thick of it, and that only left enough for easy marks, not a second copy. It's not great in Scenario 1. But like I said with Bob, if you have a Scenario 1 Finn Edwards main fighter, you should be expecting to be playing that alongside somebody who can flex fight more. You should have your team able to compensate for a slight weakness in Scenario 1 in exchange for the massive payoff that Finn Edwards promises. But the major thing that's really crazy for Finn is that when you're making this Fen deck, if you're Kluver, if you have like a Mandy Thompson, let, let's do Joe Diamond, you're playing Kluver Joe, right? You draw a rat. If you punch the rat, no one is happy. The fighter's like, what do I do now? I was gonna punch that rat for you. And you're like, I could have investigated. I didn't wanna punch that rat. But if you're the fighter and there's nothing to fight and you're like, it's cool guys, I investigate four or five to two, three times, four times, whatever. Everyone's thrilled. That's so much better than anyone wants out of their fighter. When your main fighter is just randomly picking up clues because they have nothing else to do, that actually helps your team a lot. Finn is better at getting clues as a main fighter than Roland's, especially big money Finn with all the extra actions. He's also not afraid of horror at all the way Roland is. Like there are huge gaps between good and very strong. Finn would be much higher on the tier list if he were a good fighter scenario one. However, because he isn't, he's held down all the way down at the bottom of Very Strong. He's still an incredible character. Like many rogues in the late campaign, he is a monster. But that scenario one, and in some campaigns, even scenario two, really does hold him down quite a lot. Next up, it's time to finally talk about Vincent Lee and the thing that gets him this high on the tier list. I'm not here to rate fighter Vincent Lee because that's not a good deck. I'm not here to rate Kluver Vincent Lee because it's not him at his best. No, I'm here to rate Flex Vincent Lee, and the card that carries that deck, Runic Axe. 
You see, Runic Axe has the ability to be a great fighter weapon when you go Saga Ancient Power Script Weaver. You get two charges a turn, and a charge is worth plus two accuracy, plus one damage. You can use up to three charges on the same attack, and that's a great main fighter weapon. However, if you give up Saga, so you only fight intermittently, but you're not main fighter, you're flex, that's fine, then you can take Elders. Elder says that if you succeed by Shroud value, you get a clue. So you can do absolutely stupid shit. Oh no, I drew a rat. I commit accuracy, accuracy, accuracy and triple script weave for elders, elders, elders. I beat the bag by like six, and when I kill this rat, I get three clues. And you can typically do that same sort of thing while killing two or even three health enemies by either using a fourth charge or committing skills or giving up like a clue, or maybe you don't get the clues if you get a minus four or a curse cascade or something, right? Like, Runic Axe, as a flex tool, is the strongest action compression in the entire game. Nothing's even close. Vincent Lee would not be in very strong without that. There's a lot of strong stuff going on in Vincent Lee. He's healing guard dogs, he has bandages plus surgical kit, which is a very strong combo. His card pool is a very strong, with Survivor and Seeker, and also a bit of Guardian stuff. He's a very good, flexible character in general, and he has a lot of neat combos that he's using that no one else does. His ability, unlike Carolyn's, is support that actually matters. Sure, healing health is no more valuable than healing horror in an absolute sense, but giving them a savable, unexpected courage is way, way better than giving them one resource. Additionally, you can just run Jessica Hyde, get plus one fist, that's going to be relevant for the Runic Axe, and then you can just put damage on Jessica Hyde, and she'll heal it and give you unexpected courage every single turn. Vincent Lee has so many cool little card combos that provide good, consistent value. He's just, you know, got seeker access with practice make perfect deductions and gets to abuse the shit out of the role that is Runic Axe Flex. There are not many characters that are actually good at Runic Axe Flex. So if you just have the Runic Axe, like, why aren't you just a fighter? Are you really flexing with only one card? Come on, don't lie to us. But the characters that can genuinely flex with Runic Axe do some gross stuff. And honestly, every time I make a tier list, I like think about the cards a lot while I make this video and I reevaluate them and it makes me want to invalidate it. I recorded this video already. I scrapped the footage. I've changed my opinions too much since I originally recorded it. And that original recording was a month ago. I've tested a lot of the stuff that I changed my mind on. But one thing I'm going to be testing in my future, one of the things I'm going to be trying in Hemlock Bale, I'm going to play Bless Flex Sister Mary with a Runic Axe. And I bet you she gets into A tier. I think that deck's probably nuts. I think that is actually, like it's not as, maybe with with better Bless cards, maybe it is comparable to Vincent Lee. I don't know. I doubt it. He has Seeker cards. But like Sister Mary is a flex with the new Bless stuff, probably better than this current ranking. Anyways, Runic Axe, hell of a card. Vincent Lee, great investigator. The two of them together, mm, absolutely fantastic. But speaking of Bless characters, Parallel Zoe seems pretty good. I haven't gotten to see her in action, much like Parallel Gem, this is speculative. But unlike Parallel Gem, I should have specified when I ranked them, I was referring to full Parallel. And on all these vanilla characters where I put them up and I didn't mention Parallel characters, I am referring to the full vanilla characters, I just forgot to talk about it because I wasn't thinking about it. With Parallel Zoe, I'm actually referring to what I think her strongest build will be. You know how I was just talking about Runic Axe? It's Parallel Front, Vanilla Back because I, I looked at like what you can do with her alternate card pool a lot, and I came to the conclusion that I would rather just fight with Runic Axe than all the parallel. Look, if I'm optimizing a character, it's probably not the most fun shit in the world, I'm sorry. There are probably more interesting versions of Zoe than parallel front, vanilla back, but if you just want to put an absolute shitload of blesses in the bag while being a top tier fighter, like Zoe is more mythos safe than a lot of guardians, like Lily Chen's probably more safe than her. She's more safe than Nathaniel Cho. She is, I'd say slightly above average, not crazy above average, but she's good on Mythos Resilience, got a good soak spread. The main thing is she's just better at putting blesses in the bag than even Sister Mary, and she's really, really good at it. And if you take her vanilla deck building, she's got, because the issue I have with her alternate deck building, right? And I felt like I was really struggling to put cards in the deck to do my job as a fighter while simultaneously capitalizing on the new stuff Parallel gave her. And the deck just felt like it ran smoother as a generic fighter that put blesses in the bag. But Parallel Zoe looks really good. She looks as good at fighting as the original Zoe, but 
insane at putting blesses in the bag. And I value putting blesses in the bag. I think that is a meaningful form of team support. And I'm expecting the value of it to go up a lot with Hemlock Veil. Vale. If Hemlock Veil vale doesn't really push Bless very much, which I don't think will be the case, but if that did happen, Parallel Zoe would probably fall a couple of ranks. I'd probably put her like at the very bottom of A+, maybe even below Mandy. But I think that Bless has a lot of value. And we're going to talk more about a specific card in Bless when I get to my last Mystic, who I think is the character that will be using them. But for now, I just want to say that Zoe puts a lot of Bless tokens in the bag, and her ability, like, you don't want to take them out. Other people are probably the ones that should benefit from them. But if you just want some Vicious Blows, Zoe's pretty good at getting a lot of Vicious Blows. It's not deduction, but I mean, it's pretty good. A while ago, we talked about Silas Marsh being the best user of Manor's Compass as a flex, but when it comes to Kluvers, Tempo Men is a disgustingly good deck. A lot of optimizing action compression is about saying, how do I get more than one clue with every action? And that's a huge part of why Seekers are so strong. You investigate, practice makes perfect, deduction, cool. I shortcut, practice makes perfect, deduction, cool. I move, I commit deduction. I commit deduction on the next investigate check next turn, right? That's four actions because of practice makes perfect. We're getting two clues in action. It's very efficient, it's very nice. Men can run a sharp vision, mariner's compass, look what I found, live and learn to retry a failure, which is essentially the same one clue swing that deduction is, right? Men is able to make a deck that is just constantly testing for two clues. It has nothing to do with her identity, it's just the card pool, let's be honest. And as always, that holds a character down a lot. With men, I find the reason to play her over Daryl to be rather severely lacking. However, with men, she is still an incredibly fast tempo investigator. She is getting clues hand over fist. And that is that deck is still able to fit the analytical mind support stuff in the deck. It's not able to commit as hard to it. And I find the big thing holding men down, it's not her weakness, you can build around it. it it's annoying, it's auto fail vulnerable, but it's not a huge deal. The big thing that makes men not super impressive is that because analytical mind doesn't start in play and cannot be tutored, you find yourself very frequently, like the reason to play men is their card pool. You can't get analytical mind out quick enough to reliably be the team support character that men wants to be. Her card pool is still nuts. Her stats still allow her to investigate functionally and sure she's not super mythos resilient, but Essence of the Dream will fix that and it's one of the best cards in the analytical mind, one of the best cards for beating your weakness. So in reality, she actually ends up pretty damn mythos resilient because the same thing making her afraid of her weakness is pressuring her into an early upgrade of a pretty damn good mythos card that will become team support later in a campaign. Or not later in a campaign, later in a scenario once you're fully set up. And genuinely, if she started with analytical mind in her current state, she would go straight to overpowered. But because she has to find it, because her first scenario can be a little bit awkward before she has that dream diary to reliably beat her weakness, she's going to be down in the middle of A+. And above men, getting back into some apples to oranges, we have parallel skids. This is full parallel. And even further, the skids that I love the most is the underworld market? No, support. Underworld support skids, where it is a 20 card deck, it is so tiny and you just dig through it at a breakneck pace, and it is the best user of big money in the game. Not just because Parallel Skids is better at making money than Jenny, but because your deck is so small, you find all those exceptional one-of cards super quickly. Every big money deck I make runs a one-of haste. It's not exceptional, but fine, the second one is a waste. And Skids, he, he couldn't have bought the second one. He's running this tiny gimmick deck in the first place. That's not the only reason he's this high up. It's not just that he's a super efficient big money deck. His ability gives him a ton of cash. It's what Jenny wanted, and sure, his stat line isn't much better than Jenny's. In fact, I'd argue it's a side grade. I won't say worse, but it's not meaningfully better in any way. It's a very bad stat line. But his ability is incredible. His ability isn't just money every turn. It allows you to convert manual decks two into draw two cards at will. It allows you to convert nimble into triple shortcut. It allows you to, during the enemy phase, when enemies hunt to you, gamble with quick thinking to get an action to trip them so they don't punch you after they engage you. And then you dirty fight them. And if they were low health enemies, you just kill them on the spot. There's a lot of small hidden power in his ability and its interaction with skills. 
His super efficient deck getting big money online faster than anyone else is tremendously powerful. And it goes to show just how incredibly effective big money is at fixing bad stat lines. Because three book, three fist, yeah, that's terrible. I don't care what you're doing. But five, five is pretty good. And with the black fan online, Leo DeLuca in play and Gios in play, you have five actions and five, five in your do something stat. Parallel Skids has no issues getting shit done. And if you're wondering how you're gonna commit these skills with Gios in play, it's simple. Gios only stops you from winning skills during your turn. You gamble during someone else's turn. We're outside of turns entirely. It's very easy to circumvent. Parallel Skids is a very roguey rogue. He's very strong. I love playing him unambiguously, one of my favorite investigators. It's every time I play a big money rogue, I get frustrated. It's because I want them to be what Parallel Skids is and no one else is. Next up, we have a character that I considered putting in my broken tier. We have Parallel Pete. And you might ask how this character fell an entire tier from broken. And the answer is, I don't know how to rank Parallel Pete. I played them in Forgotten Age. I thought if Parallel Pete's thing is that they use trap cards and they have a janky, non-traditional method of fighting, let's play them in the fight campaign. We need to manage all the enemies. We need to kill a shitload of snakes. We need to get so much done. Let's stress test Parallel Pete. And Parallel Pete trivialized Return to Forgotten Age. It was not even remotely difficult. There were multiple scenarios where I felt like he broke the scenario. Um, you're watching a tier list for Arkham Horror. Fuck spoilers, I don't know why I was being coy about mindless dancers. If you care, I guess this is your warning for the end of Forgotten Ages epilogue. You know how you're supposed to be in a room with Yig and there's snakes coming in the room? Yeah, did you know if you put a barricade on Yig's room, the snakes can't spawn in there with them? You just fucking beat his ass. Well, not not Pete. Pete doesn't hit him. But like your main fighter, your Rita, just beats the shit out of him and trips him and shoots him with a bow over and over again. And Pete's like, the door's locked. There's a bunch of snakes out there. They don't matter. It's fine. Because you can do that. And like anyone with Barricade could do that. That's true. You can just tech card Barricade in on your seeker at the end of Forgotten Age. I never thought about that before, but you can. But uh, Pete just runs Barricade, the upgraded version in Forgotten Age. Uh, I did it till the end. I put it in just to like see if it was a meme card and it broke the scenario in half. Hiding spot's great. The guitar is insane. Uh, the net trap, that's really good. There are so many different methods of enemy management. It's a hard deck to play. You have to like know which cards to play when and juggle them cleverly. Maybe it just feels hard and makes you feel clever. Maybe I'm exaggerating it, I don't know. But I thought Parallel Pete would be sketchy and shit. And instead, because what I was really doing, right? I knew I had a fighter Rita in Forgotten Age because we were doing like, we were doing a low vengeance run. We had Trish as our Kluber. We were going to trip all the snakes. And I was like, Parallel Pete should be the best at giving Rita room to breathe. Because I can just play a sick tune on my guitar and get a fighter off of her if she needs to knock at the bow to fight the snake. Easy peasy. More than once in that campaign, like maybe a double digit number of times, our Rita was like, what am I supposed to do? And I was like, I don't know. The problem's solved. Just like hang out. Because like, that's how it was. We would be like, There'd be like fucking six enemies in another room and none of them had a hunter or we'd have like five enemies on us. And I'd be like, hey, Rita, um, I know that you don't want to hear this, but you have soak, right? Because I have dynamite. We can easily just throw dynamite on you, deal 15 damage to enemies and three to you and neither of us will be in the room. That sound good. And Rita was like, oh, yes, please. That's so helpful. And normally when you have 15 health of enemies, you're dead. The problem is unsolvable, not because you don't have dynamite, but because they've been beating the shit out of you for multiple turns. You don't just get 15 health of enemies, but with Parallel Pete, there'd be like hiding spots. They'd be getting bounced and we would walk away and they would hunt after us impotently. You would be able to engineer these situations where I had like four or five dynamite blasts that killed four plus enemies in that campaign. I would have barricades that broke scenarios. I would put people in a net and they would just cease to exist effectively for the rest of the scenario. And a huge amount of this comes down to his ability to recur traps, and a huge amount comes down to just the guitar. He's a really great character in terms of revitalizing shit cards that never saw play. And what I'm describing is all very, very broken. But like for real though, in scenario one, he does kind of suck. And I, I'm still not convinced it's reliable. Even though I trivialized an entire campaign, I'm not convinced it always does that. And it might have been luck, I don't know. But mostly, 
I think his scenario one is kind of shit. And I think he sort of does engineer this scenario where he looks great and you could have just solved the problem with a different character. But genuinely, even though I think maybe this is like the honest ranking of him, he is kind of broken. When you play Parallel Pete, you kind of feel like you're breaking the game. And that is my criteria for what's broken as opposed to overpowered. When the game stops working correctly and you just tell the game you succeed. And when Yig is trying to yell, I'm invincible, you can't hit me, you have to kill the snakes first. And all the snakes, there's like eight of them, are in the next room because they literally cannot spawn inside of the barricade. What I'm saying is, he's very strong, unambiguously very strong. By the way, I'm talking about a flex character. I got clues with Shadowlight as well. I wasn't just doing nothing but managing enemies. However, he does feel genuinely broken, and I'm not sure if he should be higher than this. And the main thing is that his scenario one's a little bit jank and you're missing a lot of your tools but I think he might be getting severely underrated at just very high in A+. <laughs> like, even though this is a really high ranking, it might be a severe underranking. Next up, we finally got to one of the most highly ranked boring characters in the list. Everyone give a big round of applause for Daniela Reyes. She's going to get hit and then hit them. A lot. She's got bandages, she's got guard dogs, she's got a wrench. She is going to roll at a big number to hit the guy for two, probably after dealing some free damage to it. That's it. She's not going to die the mythos phase because she's invincible because she's running Pete Sylvester and Jessica Hyde. Also, she just has good mythos stats and all the mythos resilience of like Lucky and Sparrow Mask and all that bullshit. Uh, she just has extra damage from her ability as well as a good card pull for fighting because uh, Guard Dog and blue level zero is good enough for fighting. Unironically, it's better than survivor zero to five. Guardian zero is better, in my opinion, than survivor zero to five, especially in Daniela Rays, where you don't even want to upgrade your survival knife in the first place. I don't have anything else to say about Daniela Rays. She is invincible. She is mythos resilient. She beats the shit out of the guy. She is probably the best scenario one fighter in the game. She is very, very, very good at what she does. She has some limited team support. She can run a little bit of healing for her team, not very much. But that is enough for me to say that she is just absolutely rock solid. There is no criticism to Lovely against Daniela Reyes. We're at that point in the tier list. Characters no longer lack in benefits. You're not like, oh, they have a weakness. They have an Achilles heel. That's sort of what Parallel Skids and Ash Can Pete represent. They're the turning point where, this, where there's like no longer downsides on these characters. They're just insane. The only argument is how insane are they? They don't have a weakness. So for instance, Trish doesn't have a weakness. She's not going to die. She's going to pass her mythos test with big money bullshit, or maybe she's going to pass her mythos test with higher education, or maybe she's just going to fail it and Mr. Rook can eat the horror, it's not a problem. She has no shortage of answers to her relatively minor head weakness. And she has a variant of deduction on her ability, which is, you know, nuts. Absolutely incredible. Anytime your ability says get a clue, you have one of the best abilities in the game, simple as. And as I said with Matri Jack ages and ages ago, Rogue 0 to 5, Seeker 0 to 2 is an incredible card pool. Not having it is brutal for Matri Jack, and having it for Trish is incredible. It gives you access to all the broken big money bullshit that's able to save an otherwise terrible investigator like Skids, except it's on a good ability and a good stat line. She's way worse at setting it up, but she's way better as a baseline. And in fact, I would say that Trish is roughly comparable between Tempo Trish and Big Money Trish. And honestly, Big Money Trish is the less fun deck, and I tend to gravitate towards more Tempo Trish decks. They're pretty close in quality because, you know, practice makes perfect into deduction level two. It's pretty hard to use that when you run Gios. It's a huge argument against the big money generic bullshit that I usually gravitate towards. Trish gets an unreasonably good clue pace because she has a good book, access to green free actions, and access to seeker action compression. Her card pool is insane. Her ability does a lot of work. And ultimately, the reason I don't rank her higher is just because she does have a relatively minor head weakness. She does want a good chunk of experience to get a bunch of things that are all competing at the same time, but she also gets Kieran's able to help with that, so it's all told relatively minor. Like, she's very, very, very good. 
I just don't quite think she gets into my S tier. I have nothing bad to say about her, the weaknesses I can name are super minor. She gets a shitload of clues. She does what Trish is doing, but without gimping herself on money, and honestly, usually at a faster rate. Did I say Trish when I hovered men? You knew who I meant, you saw me move the mouse, I think. <laughs> but yeah, Trish is incredible. However, there are two more characters that I also think are absolutely incredible, but not quite what I would say is overpowered. I will say, a characters dominate the game. Compared to the game, they are overpowered. When I say overpowered, I mean they outshot. Like you consider playing someone in strong. If you look at a comparable character in A+, it doesn't make you think, ah shit, I shouldn't play Diana because I could be playing Agnes. That, that doesn't happen. But you look at perfectly good strong characters and you look at a character in S tier and you're like, yeah, but I could be playing them. Why am I playing this dumb curse shit when I could play you'll see the mystics up here in a little bit. And there are a couple more characters that I think don't overshadow their compatriots to the same degree. They're very strong, but they're not relatively overpowered to the rest of the investigators. And Stella Clark is one of them. Stella Clark's insane. She has incredible mythos resilience and that the mythos that couldn't hurt her if it tried, because she has three copies of super unexpected courage that also literally aren't allowed to fail the test when it comes to the mythos phase. And she also has 8-8 eight, eight Soak because, uh, just cause. And sure, she wants Quick Learner and Shed a Light got tabooed, so she has a ton of mandatory experience if you're playing like the main Kluber Stella deck. But she also just gets a free action from her ability with all the stuff that synergizes with failing an action. Now, I will say that because Quick Learner is mandatory 8, Shed a Light got nerfed, Trawling Thin got nerfed, Stella has so much mandatory experience in a relatively weak level 0 deck. In fact, I think Stella falls a lot more than I realized she fell. Because originally I had her at the bottom of my S tier, but her scenario one is genuinely nowhere near S tier. Her overall campaign is pretty close to S tier, but if she has a really weak scenario one, I'm not putting her above Parallel Ashcan. And I love Skids too much, so I'm keeping him right beside Parallel Ashcan. So I'm gonna drop her all the way to here. But she is in this same ballpark of characters that are really just immaculate powerhouses where I have no criticisms for them. No major ones, really. Jank level one, slightly unreliable level one, still very good characters. But Stella just doesn't have that progress. Progressive is the wrong word. She doesn't progress the game. She's not as useful offensively, I guess is how I would phrase it, in scenario one as she needs to be. As a main Kluver, she doesn't cut it, and her flex or God forbid fighter decks are just nowhere near as good as her Kluver decks. So that scenario one, even two and three in some campaigns, because she wants quick learners too, it's so much more mandatory experience than pretty much anyone else, it really holds her out of the S tier by a lot. And lastly, a character right on the edge of S, they are S in my heart, it's Will Yorick. Will Yorick has so much action compression from fighter, or sorry, from guardian <laughs> zero to two. It says a lot that I think of Guardian, Blue, and Fighter as interchangeable terms in my mind. So Will Yorick gets Beat Cops and Guard Dog level 2s, and those are insanely good fighting cards. I consider them weapons, and he gets to recur those after using them, and he gets bandages. Do you know how good Guard Dog is when you can bandage the Guard Dog and then resurrect the Guard Dog or the bandages? It's an insane amount of testless damage. If I were making this for Expert, I'd be putting Will Yorick in my S tier. He has more testless damage than virtually any other character in the game. He's invincible because of this very same thing. He has some limited team synergy because of bandages. It did save somebody's life when I was playing this deck. He's the best chainsaw user, not that I think chainsaw is good and it was one of the last things I upgraded. And I think I'd have been just as well off playing Machete Survival Knife as Chainsaws. I think that the Chainsaws were super cool and I liked recurring them with Act of Desperation. That was all clever and made me feel good. But on the whole, I vividly remember finishing a scenario with an 8-use Chainsaw where I hadn't actually used the Chainsaw and I'd just been killing enemies testlessly with guard dogs for about five turns. So, you know, like Chainsaws are good, but guard dog bandages is just better. He is insanely reliable, insanely safe. He can easily main fight for a team of three, and that is a ton of value. But he can't do all of that and get clues. He doesn't really make your teammates much safer. 
Ultimately, because he is not progressing the game or making your teammates safer while they progress the game, he's just fighting real good. The question becomes this. Can I put Will Yorick in S tier because he is capable of three-man fighting? And my answer is no. And the reason for that is because while he can three-man fight, I had scenarios where our team struggled because I was responsible for three-man fighting. I was doing it in that campaign. And it's because Will Yorick, while he can do it, he needs to set up first. He needs to dig all of his cards out of the short supply graveyard. He needs a couple of turns while he really comes online to do it. And he's not three-man fighting from turn one. He's not so good at fighting that I think he can really reliably three-man fight. You still want someone to flex at least a little. And he is so close to us. He is one of my favorite characters in the game. He is incredibly powerful. But I do not put him in my S tier. So let's start talking about the massive seeker bias inherent in this tier list. We're going to talk about Norman Withers. They're not really a seeker. They're a mystic in a trench coat. But like, um, who needs deduction level two when you can just play deduction level one every turn? Am I right? I guess it's level zero, but you know what I meant. Astronomical Atlas Norman Withers is just silly. There's also other ways to get clues. You're virtually immune to the Mythos deck because of Warrior Protection, Promise of Power, and Forehead. Norman Withers does what Menti Fan does with a single card while being actually safe to the Mythos deck, not just safe to the half of it that gives head test. Menti Fan has to find Analytical Mind and Dream Diary, and then she can help somebody, and Norman Withers just has Word of Protection 2 and Promise of Power, and as a dedicated Kluver, your fighter should be with you for that Promise of Power, so it didn't really matter that you had Analytical Mind in the first place, did it? Norman Withers just... He's got the secret sauce. The secret sauce is Seeker cards with Mystic cards and a small, tight deck, filled with draw and clue acceleration. That's all it is. It's just a really, really good place to live. And I do think it would be better if he had more access to Seeker cards, which is why I have Daisy right above him. Because Daisy, no, she doesn't recur with Astronomical Atlas, but she does get Deduction Level 2. She does get to recur that with Practice Makes Perfect. She does get to cycle her deck quickly. She gets free action clues like Grim Memoir. She has better draw than Norman on account of Old Book of Lore. You can run both in one deck. She has the Clue Dropper archetype if you want to focus on team support or the more tempo-oriented deck, which I think is probably better, but it's very close because William T. Nelson is a genuinely broken card. I think the combination of the raw power of the Seeker card pool combined with five book and purple cards for their insane team utility is... It's almost unparalleled as a raw card pool. Like, Daisy and Norman both have abilities that do stuff, and they're not, like, the craziest abilities, but they are good abilities that get them... That they definitely give them good value. They're easily in the top half of abilities. They're not nuts. They're not, like, unique recursion shenanigans. They're not deduction. They're not this. I don't I don't even know how to summarize Daniela's ability. Tesla's evasion on a fighter that has no foot. That's where it's at its best. It also is just, like, Tesla's damage. Just, like, you know, end your turn by engaging a cult as it's dead. That's really efficient. It's basically what Will Yorick's doing with less steps, but same deal. This is just an incredible place for a card pool to live. I cannot, in good faith, put these characters in A+, and say that Ursula and Daisy are playing the same game. Access to purple cards in another book is just so much stronger than what Ursula does. And Norman Withers is, you know, doing the same thing, but genuinely. And I am tentatively saying that Jacqueline Fine is better than those two Seekers. This is the Mystic where I'm going to talk about the new curse card. I forget its name. No, I don't. It's the Key of Solomon. It is a four experience, two cost hand asset book, I believe. And it allows you to remove either a bless or curse in the back, whichever is more, more common. If it's a curse, you gain two resources. If it's a bless, you heal anyone or anything at your location for two of anything. So it's essentially, if you have more blesses and curse in the bag, if you're in a bless team, it is Soothing Melody as a lightning bolt. That wasn't an action I was talking about. But instead of having to play anything, you just remove a blast from the bag. That's the best healing card in the game. There's nothing close to it. So part of why I have Jacqueline this high is because Jacqueline doesn't really need much of anything in her deck. And she doesn't have a great use for her hand slot. So what Jacqueline can do is just be in a blessed team to passively be the best healer in the game. Also, she's a five head mystic with access to Voice of Raz, an unironic economy card that no one else even gets to use, really. And then on top of that, she has an ability that says once per turn, the auto fail is not going to happen. 
you dodge signature twice per turn, but who needs that many auto fail negations? So like you're about to flamethrower a guy with five fists and four health and you're really stressed? No, you're not. You're just going to hit. I don't know how to quantify how valuable that is, but if someone put Jacqueline at like the top of their tier list in what I'm calling my S plus tier, I could not in good faith say I think they are clearly wrong. Jacqueline's ability is team support auto fail negation. And that's crazy. That's incredibly, incredibly strong. However, she is a five head mystic, which comes with its standard problems of if your card pool doesn't help you and being mono purple, hers sure as hell doesn't. She has bad mobility and bad card draw. It's not terrible anymore. You can run summon server and scroll of secrets and try to jank your way out of that situation, but it isn't the best. And I think she deserves to be an overpowered for sure. Her ability is just ridiculous and five head mystic, as we established earlier, is a very good baseline. I still think Wendy's better at negating the auto field, though. I mean, like literally it just doesn't happen to Wendy and then she has discard synergy and then she gets to recur events like one of the most reliable pilfers in the game because she just has access to base for book and track shoes, putting her at Winifred tier if she can just find like anything to boost her foot, you know, like Pete Sylvester, uh, which Winifred doesn't get, but it's fine. Winifred commits a ton of skills, but Wendy just gets to like play one of the best assets in the game instead of building an entire deck around making pilfer work. She has so many different strong things she can do. She's one of the characters that has an infinite that's got bands. I say got banned. I mean, she, I mean, she probably has a tabooed infinite. That's probably also true. I mean, an infinite that I'm choosing not to talk about. There's a good chance she has more than one infinite. And I haven't looked into them in a long time. Wendy's just stupidly efficient and powerful. She has a ton of crazy recurs and shit. She gets to negate the auto fail more than any rogue in the game. She gets to live the foot matters dream because event recursion is something that rogues desperately want when they're trying to make foot matter because it's just a couple of key events that are really doing it in addition to track shoes and pete sylvester essentially giving her six foot wendy also can't auto fail on her pilfer i need to just, i can't overstate that she can't auto fail she can't auto fail the pilfer also she doesn't need to upgrade pilfer to recur it it just happens no matter what token she draws and if she auto fails her pilfer rather than you know, losing the pilfer and not recurring pilfer three, she just redraws the token and succeeds. Every foot matters rogue lives in perpetual fucking envy of Wendy. A lot of characters live in perpetual envy of Wendy. And every time I say that your proactive stats are super important, and if you have bad proactive stats matter, there's a little asterisk, and the asterisk says, do not at me about Wendy Adams. I know. Wendy Adams is just it's she's so good she is so stupidly strong and it's every part of her card pool and her character card every single bit of it is a powerhouse and she does not have any weakness at all even like scenario one like if you're worried just in the thick of it easy mark double lock pick you're just rock solid you're fine it's so so easy to make wendy adams into a top tier character Someone who I think requires a little bit more work and is not as clean cut into the S tier, but is clearly a powerhouse, is Luke Robinson. The thing that I think truly breaks Luke wide open is true magic. As a seeker with access to research librarian or just increased draw through things like deep knowledge, he is better at enabling true magic than anyone else. And you want to do the more just like high draw variant. And the reason for that is because like Mr. Rook gives you health soak on a guy with five health, Deep Knowledge helps you find all of your cards, same with Mr. Rook, because you don't need to just find True Magic, you also need to find all of your different spells so you can use True Magic perfectly. And the big thing is, because you need True Magic to happen twice a turn, if it's just once a turn it's not very good, you need Twyla Catherine Price, I think is the name of the ally, the one that readies an asset. So you use Twyla Catherine Price to essentially get two True Magics, you use Luke Robinson's Seeker Access to negate Drawl being a weakness of Mystic, you use Luke Robinson's Gatebox to negate movement being a weakness of Mystic. Not that you needed it because you had Seeker cards, but it's better to use the Gatebox. You have unique bullshit, just like Parallel Skids, where the enemies run up to you. You Gatebox out, they all look around and end their turn in confusion. Luke Robinson, True Magic Flex, is one of the strongest characters in the game. I think Luke Robinson, just full stop, is one of the best characters in the game. But that True Magic build is well and truly busted. Of all the characters that play a standard flex game, they're not doing anything silly, they're not relying on like one super broken card. Luke Robinson is a true flex character, no bullshit, that does it honestly. 
They're not doing jank like Wendy Adams. There's a flex character I'm going to talk about in a little bit. They're not doing it that way. Luke Robinson is an honest-to-God flex that excels at every single part of the game. And I think they are one of the most fun characters because of it. They just don't have a weakness, and Gatebox is fun as hell. Anyway, uh, it's still probably worse than Rex Murphy. Like, Deduction's a really good card, and he just gets one every turn. Like, Norman has to spend experience and put shit into play and do some weird deck juggling nonsense with his signature and astronomical atlas to make it happen. Rex just, like, he has Lucky Cigarette Case in play and he just gets a deduction in a card. He gets five splash, and you know what they are? They're Lucky Cigarette Case, Promise of Power, Promise of Power, Leo DeLuca. I forget the fifth one, it's equally degenerate, right? Like, his five splash are some of the best cards in the game on a Seeker that gets to directly synergize with and capitalize on them. Because Promise of Power is practice, because of course it is. Rex's ability is just stupid. Uh, oh, it's Falsity and Bargain, that was the fifth one. And because Deep Knowledge and Falsity and Bargain and Archive of Conduits and Eye of uh, Truth and Promise of Power, this all works on your team. Like, I had a Rex game in Forgotten Age where I was Soul Clover. <laughs> This is just a thing with me. We play Return to Forgotten Age and say, you two do one roll. I'm going to do the other one alone. I don't know how this keeps happening. Uh, I had a turn where somebody drew a Mythos card. I don't remember what it was. I played Practice Makes Perfect to guarantee I give them four question marks and they pass because I had four copies of that in my deck. I gave them Eye of Truth, I think, but it, it doesn't matter. Like Rex is actually one of the best support characters in the game because with Archive of Conduits, he's also one of the best healers. He can give them Draw with Deep Knowledge, Money with Falstian. He's getting insane amounts of clues so quickly that he has time to fuck around and support. Not that anyone is more important than him since he's the cluver, but like, you're playing a cooperative game. You should you should make him feel good, right? You should you shouldn't like constantly yell, I'm the cluver, I'm the seeker, I'm more important than you. Everyone knows it's true, but it's rude to say it. And Rex is unironically one of the best support characters in the game just because of his card pull and clue finding speed, allowing him both the support cards and the time to do it. I do think, although it's very apples to oranges, that Tony is a better fighter than Rex is a Kluver. However, I'm going to put Rex above Tony because of one specific thing that I've changed my mind on at the last moment. Tony has to play Scenario 1 with Knuckle Dusters, and uh, that shit's scary as hell. Like, in Scenario 1, you aren't drawing your deck as fast, you aren't as immune to the Mythos phase. We tell you, know, Knuckle Dusters can be scary as hell in Scenario 1 on Tony sometimes. I know you have other weapons, you try to avoid them in Scenario 1, but still. But Tony Morgan has an unreasonable amount of action economy. I, I could compare him to Vanilla Skids, but that's a dead horse. You know, everyone knows. It's a tragic comparison. Tony Morgan gets at least six free resources in a game. At least six free fight actions in a game. It's very frequently more than this, due to both his signature weapons and the star asset. Or the star token, rather. He has a card pool that allows him to run Seeker cards to draw through his deck faster. He has access to Underworld Market to guarantee he draws his weapons pretty much immediately. He has access to Unlimited Soak and Lonnie, the big money deck to make him Mythos immune and give him more actions to stab more. Like, you can make a Tony deck that swings Switchblade 11 times in a turn or something like that. You shouldn't. You should just settle for 7 and being good at everything else too. And this Tony deck, just coincidentally, it's like a 5 action, 6 action deck right? It's five from Black Band, Leo, and then six from Haste. Like, you can investigate six times in a turn with the fully set up Tony at five book. And I know that doesn't sound like a thing a main fighter is supposed to do, but like, when the Mythos deck didn't do anything to you and all the enemies are dead, you, you got time. You may as well just get some clues. Because like, you come down to the bottom of the list, you're like looking at like a book-based Marie Lambeau just being worse than a set up Tony at investigating, right? Like, it's stupid. It's degenerate. Tony doesn't want to get loose. He just wants to have a good time and stab some dudes. But the fact that he can become a mythos immune, that he can help get clues, he doesn't support his team. He drags them kicking and screaming to the finish line. He's not going to help your team like a Jacqueline would, or like Daisy or Norman or even Rex. He's just going to fucking do it himself. And that's why he's this high in the list. And it's why I originally had him above Rex and why I go back and forth. But Scenario 1 Knuckle Dusters is terrifying. Someday I'm going to play Tony Morgan, I'm going to die to Karen's Opal Scenario 1 on the third consecutive autofail retaliate. It's just going to happen. But that's the literal only weakness the character has. So yeah, he's absolutely nuts. 
Speaking of absolutely nuts, Amanda Sharp is the epitome of overpowered. I'm not sure what number of deductions you need to win a scenario. Norman and Rex both posit that one a turn is probably enough and conclusively prove that it is. However, while you can support your team by saving them in the Mythos phase, Amanda opts instead to minimize the number of Mythos phases you will experience by just getting all the clues now. Why bother having a turn 10 when we can leave on turn 7? Because, you know, it's, it's not hard to make an Amanda deck that investigates 5 times with deduction level 2 more than once in a game. You should have at least like 2 or 3 turns as Amanda where you're doing that. And I'm not sure how many deductions you need to win a game. Amanda easily doubles that number, probably triples or even quadruples it. This is how high you rank a character that just obliterates the clue game, not like exceeds what the game wants, not even crushes what the game wants. If Amanda is on your team, clues are not a concern. They're handled. She's also functionally mythos immune later in the campaign because of the red gloved man and she will run cards like Inquiring Mind and Promise of Power, making her pretty mythos resilient in addition to probably having a soak ally, whether that just be a Milan she doesn't want to lose or a mystery rook or a research librarian. There's plenty of ways to be mythos resilient but not immune before the red gloved man. Amanda is just insanely powerful. She's still playing the game though. That's the thing to remember when you look at these overpowered characters. The game is still functioning. We're beating it into a bloody pulp. We're humiliating the game. But the game is still being played according to the original rules. And that's still very much true with Harvey Walters. I'm, I'm going to die on this hill. Don't tell me Ursula's card pool is bad because Harvey's is worse and I don't give a shit. Seekers have the best cards in the game. I don't fucking care what the rest of your card pool is. Like, yes, you can get Promise of Power. You can get Ward of Protection. You can get Mariner's Compass. There's good cards that aren't in Seeker. Everyone knows this. But you don't need them if you have Seeker cards. You'll be just fine. So Harvey Walters' weakness is not going to hurt you. I've covered this before. Other people have covered this. You can just never blow up as Harvey. In fact, pretty much the only way to die on Harvey is to put Dream Diary, or sorry, not Dream Diary, Dream Enhancing Serum in your deck. And if you choose to build a deck that has 15 card hands in Harvey, then, I mean, that's not Harvey being bad. You're the problem. Harvey's weakness is not a problem. Harvey is going to be able to draw his deck pretty much every turn. Uh, every couple of turns, that two or three, let's be honest with ourselves. But he's the only character that gets to play Farsight. Because if you want to play Farsight and say Rex Murphy, because Rex can do anything, he, he's got no push or pull towards any specific archetype. That's why you can play support so effectively. If you wanted to do it in Rex, you need to run some shitty asset that improves your hand size. You need to run a bunch of draw cards to reliably stay above eight to keep Farsight enabled. Harvey's signature says your hand size is 10, Farsight's enabled. Harvey's ability says you're drawing unreasonable number of cards. You don't need to run anything beyond deep knowledge, and even deep knowledge is a little bit excessive, but it's good on turn one, and it's good for team support, so you take it. So Harvey Walters, without putting a single experience or card into his deck, gets to enable Farsight. Well, obviously he has to put Farsight in his deck. That's, you know what I mean. And Farsight is one of the strongest cards in the game. It is incredibly, incredibly powerful. It is a huge amount of tempo. It is essentially jank Leo DeLuca, and it's no safeguard, but it is still a jank Leo DeLuca and incredibly powerful. You can use that for multiple events that get two clues. You can use that for events that give you resources that you can then spend on a cult lexicon. You can use that on a blood right from a cult lexicon. Did you know Harvey Walters can deal nine Tesla's damage in two actions? It does cost him nine resources. It's not a problem. He can pay for it because he's he's playing Burning the Midnight Oil as free actions with Farsight. Like, Farsight Harvey Walters is one of the better flex characters in the game, and he only runs one damage dealing card. I still vividly remember my teammates distressingly talking to each other about how to deal with mindless dancers. And I was just like, I can kill this one. Like I let them talk for a while. I, 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 we, people had started getting mad at me when I suggested blood right plays in the previous scenarios. And after like a minute of them panicking, I was like, guys, I have blood rights. I can just solve one of them for you. Cause that's just how it is with Harvey. Harvey can easily get enough clues cause he's a seeker. He's cycling his deck every two turns so he can practice makes perfect deduction level two pretty much non-stop. It's not even remotely hard for him to do. He can flex fight with insane viability. He's immune to the Mythos deck, because like I said, if you're building in a way where you're just like not dying to your damage weakness, that tends to also mean like Mr. Rook is there. You have Horror Soak that goes hand in hand with your damage soak. You're just safe. You're fine. Harvey's nuts. 
He gets so many clues just from brutalizing with Farsight and rapid cycling practice makes perfect deduction too. Incredible flex fighting from being the best enabler of uh, Farsight, Bloodrite. And here's the one that I think is most often overlooked, the one that goes hard in scenario one. When you play Deep Knowledge, we all agree that Deep Knowledge is insane, right? You play a card, you draw three cards, you put two curses in the back. The net effect of Deep Knowledge is plus two to hand size, plus two curses in back. That's what it does. Harvey's ability says that anyone on your team can spend an action, draw a card, and get a second card. What did that action do? Plus two to hand size. Harvey's ability lets anyone deep knowledge at will without putting the curses in bag once around. It's better than deduction. I'm not exaggerating when I say that. It is, in my mind, clearly, unambiguously better than deduction. And when you put it into that frame of reference, that his ability converts a basic action into deep knowledge plus, it helps to visualize why that draw is so powerful. He's still not at the top of overpowered though. That's motherfucking Mark Harrigan. Let's talk about this. I'm gonna wind back to right after I got hyped and put Mark Harrigan here. I wanna make an entire deck tech on Flex Mark, and I'm going to. Because we're raiding Flex Mark, and the deck is a jank, and you haven't seen it probably, and I. I don't know if I played it on the channel. I don't think I've ever played a refined format on the channel. I played an entire Circle Undone campaign as Flexmark, using Bestow Resolve, all four of the neutral skills, and abusing the absolute hell out of Runic Axe. That same exact Runic Axe and Vincent Lee, if you attack with Mark Harrigan and you tap Sophie, you're swinging four higher than Vincent Lee. You can reliably, easily beat any Shroud value. You have access to Vicious Blow too. I one-shot a Mindless Dancer, beat the entire bag by the Shroud value, and got three clues. And that wasn't like a, whoa, what a surprisingly good turn for Mark. That was expected. That was one action to kill one of those dangerous enemies in the game and get three clues. And I committed one card to the test. And that's not the only thing the deck does. This is a support deck. I'm gonna have to make a deck deck on it because it's such a cool deck, and I will, it'll be up tomorrow. But. Flex Mark Harrigan runs Bestow Resolve and all four neutral skills. If you're with somebody and they get any bad Mythos card, let's say it's a foot test, you give them manual decks and the timing window where you commit a card, and then after that, there's a lightning bolt window that you use to trigger Bestow Resolve and you put a second card into the test. And yes, that does work. You give them manual decks and perception. They say, oh cool, plus four, you gave me promise of power without a curse, that's cool. And then they pass, and then you draw two cards and it's incredible. I was talking a second ago about Deep Knowledge Plus on Harvey. Promise a Power Plus. Curse, no, 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 draw two cards. Much better, way better. And because Mark draws so many cards, because I'm over here hemorrhaging health, tapping Sophie to hit dudes for more to get clues with my axe, or to draw desperately for the axe in the case that I've missed it, I am actually like really reliably able to cycle my deck, keep giving out these cards, keep making everyone pass every test, keep drawing healing cards, keep drawing second wind, keep drawing soothing melody. I'm not the main fighter. I have time to play these cards. Think about how good that action I said was a second ago. One shot of mine is dancer. Get three clues. If a flex character did that in two turns, you'd be happy with them. That was one action. You have so much time to play your shitty little healing cards. And second wind draws a card and heals for two. Solemn Val just flat heals for two and has team support. Flex Mark made my whole team invincible to the Mythos phase, had insane action compression, never felt remotely in danger at any point. It is my favorite deck in the game. I originally had Mark like low S tier. I think I actually would put Fighter Mark down here under Will Yorick. And I got so hyped for Flex Mark, and I put him like below Wendy Adams. And then I played him, and I think he is the most powerful character in the game that does not break the game. There's a real argument that I should be putting Flex Mark in my broken tier, but I don't think he breaks the game in the right way. Because we're still taking the test, I'm just giving you all the things you need to pass it. I think it's fine. So let's talk about the characters that are left. The characters that I believe are genuinely broken. There's only two, and one of them is Daryl Simmons. Daryl Simmons effectively has unlimited unexpected courage. That's his ability. 
but it's far, far better than that. You have to run something to make it unlimited. And if you're using like a Hawkeye folding camera, it's not really unlimited. But if you're running the clue dropper archetype with William Mailson, first of all, you just get to say no to any mythos card once around, which is pretty good. But because of research notes, you will have virtually unlimited evidence to use this ability on all the time. And the big crazy thing about all these unexpected courages you're gonna get, because with the research notes taboo, the deck does get nerfed, but in Daryl, you still get to regain the clues you lost with one research notes and then use the evidence on the other, and it's still something of value being gained by taking the archetype. With Daryl, it's not that you're giving out skills, that's the same thing that Mark does, and he's doing it worse than Mark, but he's lowering the skill value of the test. And with all of these cards, where like Rotting Remains, test three, the amount you fail by is the damage you take. It Like if there was a card that just said take one horror as a mythos card, that would honestly be kind of soft. And that's the worst case scenario when Daryl spends an evidence on Rotting Remains. And there are a ton of fail by X cards where having a Daryl on your team just sort of negates them. Also, he is literally men, but with one more book. So like this is, so like uh, here is roughly his baseline before we start talking the ability, right? Daryl has a way of negating the game that is very genuinely, it's not super broken. I think in terms of raw power, he's probably like around Luke Robinson. But the team support and the way the game just sort of ceases to function right when Daryl is spamming evidence on shit is really, really crazy. The main reason S plus exists, because I would not have made S plus just for Daryl. I'd have been happy to put Daryl around Luke Robinson. <laughs> I would be so happy to put Luke Robinson in S plus, but I can't do that. No, the main reason S plus exists is because I wanted Gloria to be clearly marked as in a tier of her own. Because no one, and I mean no one, trivializes the game the way Gloria does. Admittedly, in a four-player game, Gloria is less powerful. But Gloria essentially just tells the Mythos deck no. She gets to pick what cards you're drawing and in what order. And that is just actually stupid. I, I First of all, let, let's wind it back. I was talking about how Daryl is comparable to men. Gloria is, like, as a baseline, comparable to Dexter. It's a slightly weaker character, to be sure. But Dexter doesn't have access to seeker cards like Deep Knowledge. I would put Gloria's baseline probably pretty similar to Agnes's baseline. And the ability to hand out Mythos cards to whoever you want, right? Like, there are cards, Nature of the Beast and uh, First Watch, the, the card specifically does that thing. That's the point of the card. And Gloria just gets Alyssa Graham in play and does that every turn, recursively, over and over and over again. If you have a Gloria in your team, cards just don't show up. You're like, hey, where's Deep Wind Bull? And Gloria's like, it's not. And you're like, what do you mean it's not? It's like, don't worry about it. Here's Rotting Remains. And you're like, oh, thanks. I've got five head. What did you draw? And Gloria's like, Obscuring Fog. And every turn is like that. The entire campaign with Gloria. Every single turn, nothing bad happens. Anyone who draws a test was really good at it too. Isn't that weird? It completely and utterly trivializes the game. It's fucking bullshit. And honestly, Daryl doesn't deserve to be in Gloria tier. And I don't think deserves to be even above Wendy Adams. I think his ability is genuinely incredible. But I'm going to keep S plus on the tier list just for Gloria. I could obviously put her at the top of my S tier and delete broken, right? I could do that. But I think it conveys the notion that Gloria and Norman Withers exist in the same level of power. And they don't. I'm happy to say that Agnes and William Yorick are approximately similar characters. All right, maybe not Mandy and Parallel Jim, because I've still got gems, like a lot of anti-gem bias, but Carolyn and the severely tabooed Mandy? Yeah, they're roughly similar. Bob and Leo? Yeah. Jenny and Calvin? Yeah. But I'm not happy to say that Gloria is at the same level of power as anyone. Maybe starting with Amanda, I'd be okay with it. But Gloria is so much stronger than them that the real name of this tier has always been Gloria tier. That's it. Like, I wanted it to be S+. In my heart, I was like, there's multiple broken characters, but 
I can pair the team support of Daryl and Mark, and it is approximately similar. And Daryl has to do the jank clue dropping stuff that can sometimes have problems for your team and sometimes not be allowed. Or he has to play a tempo build that's notably worse at doing the team support, and Mark doesn't have those restrictions on his team support. His restrictions that he needs to be next to you. Kind of, because it does work from location away with bestow resolve. But like he has safeguard level two, so it's not even a restriction. I think Daryl is strong enough. It's the same thing I was talking about like with Ashcan Pete, right? I think what they do is broken. It deserves to be up here for talking about broken characters. But the actual power level is lower. At the end of the day, I was trying to justify having a tier for just Gloria. And I'm not going to. It's just Gloria tier. No one else is on the same level. And hopefully no one else can be on this level. And I'm gonna be real with you. Because it makes me happy, I'm doing this. <laughs> I'm moving Will Yorick to my S tier and I'm moving Mandy to my A+. That looks better. That feels more right. Although by getting rid of S plus and making these adjustments, I have ruined my bell curve that previously existed. But I think this is maybe a more honest assessment of the characters. But for now, I have talked at length about these characters. I hope that you can at least see where I'm coming from and that this video was either entertaining or enlightening for you. And I'm looking forward to making a deck tech on this Mark Harrigan for tomorrow. But for now, thank you very much for watching if you stuck with me to the end. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, Evan and Jeffrey B, and I'll see you in the next one. I'm gonna go drink some water.